There was a flash of lightning in the sky, and the rain formed deep puddles on the road. Some kind of truck was picking up a passenger car, and a woman with a child in this car said that it looks like these are people of the Ning family. Her husband asked why they were here. He has already given up the fight for the inheritance. Further along the road, people lined up and started shooting at the car. The man slammed on the brakes and shouted that they had damaged the brakes, the car wouldn't stop, and the doors don't open either. The woman threw her son out of the car window, and the man shouted to his son Ning Bei that he must survive. Immediately after this, the car left the bridge and fell into the water. Thirteen years have passed since that night. The now adult Ning Bei stood on board the cruise ship and thought about the Dragon City. The time has come to settle issues that were thirteen years old. He, Ning Bei, has finally returned. Suddenly someone asked, is he blind? Ning Bei turned towards the voice and saw a guy and a girl accompanied by guards. The girl told young Master Liang that these were the shoes from the limited latest collection that he bought for her. She put them on for the first time, and this little scoundrel has already soiled them. The old man apologized to them and said that he was very sorry. The child simply did not understand. He is ready to pay. The girl called the old man a freak and told him not to approach them. Mr. Liang asked, does he even know how much these shoes cost? Even if he sells the child for organs, it still won't be enough. He looked at his guard and said that he should throw the old man as fish food. The guard obeyed him and Ning Bei became angry. He came forward and said that while he was here, no one would lay a finger on them. Mr. Yang asked, who else is he? How dare he stand in his way? Does he even know who owns this city? Ning Bei asked, does he know who he is? Mr. Yang asked, is he talking about the old man? He doesn't care who he is. Ning Bei replied that he was a veteran of this city's fire department, and the scar on his face was a mark of his glory. He protected the city from fire and saved countless people. And he humiliates him like this. He should have been killed here, Mr. Liang began to worry and said that no one in Dragon City would dare touch him. He is from the Liang family, so don't dare to be insolent to him. Ning Bei suddenly approached him and asked, Is the Liang family so influential? He did not wait for an answer and grabbed him by the clothes and then threw him over himself and he fell to the floor. Ning Bei asked, How about this? He will show him what real strength is. After that, the beaten mister. Liang descended from the liner and shouted that his people had already arrived. He will die as soon as he comes down. Ning Bei looked at Mr. Liang with contempt and he told him to get down. He will show him the strength of the Liang family. People began to march towards the liner. Ning Bei looked at the people with uniforms and blades with a smile and Mr. Pins Liang was surprised. They let them through and he asked his subordinate what was going on. Who are they? The man asked him to be quiet. Judging by the coat of arms, these are the blades of the King of the North. The blades of the King of the North lined up in front of the liner, and then raised their blades up and said in unison that the Northern Detachment greets the commander. Ning Bei began to descend and said that he was an ordinary person without rank or title. Let them call him simply by his name. The guy asked how they can directly address the commander by name. They won't dare break the rules. Ning Bei called this guy by the name Mu Cheng and said that he did not expect that it would be him who was greeting him. Did he cross the border? Mu Cheng said that he could punish him if he wished. How was his journey? Were there any problems? Ning Bei looked at Mr. Verli Liang and said that that guy had declared that no one in Dragon City would dare to touch him. The King of the North's blades began to surround him and his subordinate said that there was a misunderstanding. Mu Cheng said that they will continue this misunderstanding. Ning Bei said that the rest had nothing to do with it, only Liang Yu. Liang Yu fell to the floor and asked Ning Bei to spare him. Ning Bei did not pay attention to him, and meanwhile some girl was standing by the car and asked her grandmother why they had been waiting for half an hour, and he was still not there. He makes them wait. What kind of groom is this? She leaves. Her grandmother said that if she left, she would break her legs. The girl immediately stopped, and the man who ran up to them said that he was already coming. They saw Ning Bei, and the old woman told King Yi that he is here. Let her hurry up. King asked her to calm down, and a man approached Ning Bei. He called out to Mu Cheng and said that he had crossed the border. Did he forget the prohibitions? Violators must be severely punished. The old woman said that this is the central blade of Zhang Zhongquan and the northern tiger Mu Cheng. It's amazing that they all gathered here. Ning Bei greeted Zhang Zhongquan and said that so many years have passed. Who is he going to punish? Zhang Zhongquan knelt down in front of him and said that the commander of central China greets the commander of northern China. Ning Bei said that they are equal to him. There is no need for such politeness. Zhang Zhongquan stood up and said that all five great commanders were ready to serve him. 
Ningbei patted him on the shoulder and agreed. Then he saw the old woman and king and came closer to them. He knelt down on one knee in front of the old woman, and she said that he had grown so much and become so thin. Ningbei affectionately called her grandmother, and she dragged him to the car and said that they were going to her home. Ningbei asked her not to rush so much, and then he stayed by the car. He called out to Mu Chang and said that he and his group should return to northern China, and he, Zhang Zhongquan, would go with him. They obeyed him, and after that they all got into the car together and hit the road. The old woman told Ningbei that thirteen years flew by in a flash. He had grown up a lot. Ningbei said that if she had not protected him, he would not have been able to grow up, and would have died even then. The old woman pointed at King, and said that it was Su King. King introduced herself, and Ningbei said that if she was against their wedding, then she could break off the engagement. King immediately asked, Is this true? Her grandmother said she couldn't. King told her that the 21st century is here, and she arranged an engagement when she was a child. Her classmates laugh at her. Her grandmother said that this wedding was arranged by Grandfather Ning and their Sioux family. As long as she is alive, no one can cancel this. Ning Bei told her not to be angry. King has his own head on his shoulders. The old lady smiled and asked Ning Bei, is he familiar with the central blade of Zhang Zhangquan and the northern tiger Mu Cheng? Ning Bei confirmed her words and said that they were quite close. Zhang Quan often sharpened and cleaned his sword. Zhang Zhangquan smiled and said that this is the sword of the King of the North. Not everyone is allowed to touch it. Qin thought Zhang Zhangquan, the renowned commander of central China, was cleaning his weapons. Indeed. Ning Bei said that King is dear to Grandma, which means he will protect her for the rest of his life. So if anyone offends her, he will slaughter his family down to the third generation. He looked at Zhang Kuang and said that on his behalf, let him announce to the world that Su King is under his protection, and if anything happens to her, the sword of the northern king will fall on the culprit. Zhang Quan agreed, and the old woman said that this was her boy. Su King thought, does he want to announce this to the whole world? This is too much. After a while, they arrived at the Su family's house, and people came out saying that Lady Su had returned. They welcomed distinguished guests. Ning Bei helped Grandma out of the car, and a man from the Su family asked, Honorable guest, isn't this Ning Bei? Why did she bring him again? Everyone knows that that accident was not an accident at all, but it still saved Ning Bei and brought the wrath of the three heads of the Ning family upon them. She should break off that stupid engagement and get rid of Ning Bei. This is the best way. The others agreed with his words and said that they should not get into trouble. Su King thought that no matter what, they are guests from afar, they can't be treated like this. Zhang Zhongquan began to get angry and Ning Bei told him to calm down. Lady Su said that Ning Bei is the son-in-law of her Su family. He is Su King his future husband. As long as she is alive, no one can offend him. Su King called out to her grandmother and said that she said that she was against this marriage. Ning Bei turned to his grandmother and said that since Su King is against it, it's okay, he will treat her like a younger sister. Lady Su said his name indignantly, and he said that if he broke off the engagement, it would have a bad effect on the reputation of the Su family. But if they write a letter of refusal, he will sign it tomorrow. Su King asked, will this not harm his reputation? Ning Bei replied that it was nothing. The man said that since he didn't mind, they would break off the engagement. Zhang Zhongquan stepped forward and said that if they just try to do this, if they don't dare, he will slaughter their entire family. Ning Bei called out to Zhang Zhongquan, and the man asked who he was. Does he want to destroy his Su family? Where does he get so much courage from? Zhang Zhongquan asked, who is he? He is Zhang Zhongquan, the commander of central China. He thinks this is not enough to destroy their family. Mu Cheng along with the rest of the people walked up to him and said that Commander Mu Cheng of the North was also ready to join. He thinks this is not enough to destroy their family. Guo Beifeng approached them and said that he was the commander of the South, Guo Beifeng. He thinks this is not enough to destroy their family. Lu Gui came from the other side and said that he was the commander of the West, Lu Gui. He thinks this is not enough to destroy their family. All four of them gathered and Ning Bei thought that four of the five commanders were here now. Guo Beifong bowed to Ning Bei and said that he welcomes the return of King Ning Bei. Lu Gui also greeted Ning Bei and the man was surprised and asked what all these big shots are doing here. Mu Cheng asked, do they consider their family so powerful that they cannot exterminate them? Some guy appeared from behind the man and said that he thought so. So what? Lady Su exclaimed, this is so presumptuous. Ning Bei told her not to worry, and she said that as long as he was here, she wouldn't worry about anything. 
but she is annoyed by the boys from the Su family who do not understand what they are doing. Ningbei told Zhang Zhongquan that he should show them. Zhang Zhongquan immediately announced an A1 level alert within hours, and the news of the alarm spread throughout the city and reached the central headquarters. The girl at the central headquarters said that when the A1 level alarm is activated, in 72 places everyone goes into a combat position. Does he confirm the order? If this affects the common people, the Dragon Guard will be on guard. Ningbei said that all 72 points are too much, one is enough. Zhang Zhongquan said that he understood. He asked the girl, did she hear? It cancels the previous order, one group is enough. The girl agreed and some guy asked her who it was. The commander seems to respect him very much. The girl sat down on a chair and replied that this was an ordinary person Ningbei. The guy exclaimed, Ningbei. The king of the north called the god of war. The girl replied that it was he. Although she doesn't know much about him, his case is on the ninth floor and is closed even to her. Meanwhile, at the Sioux family's house. The guy laughed and said that he had been talking so much and nothing was happening. It looks like they're just hired actors. He took out his phone and asked if they were hired for a couple of hundred. Then he will hire someone. Suddenly, he was very surprised, looking at the phone screen, and asked what was happening. Why doesn't he have a signal? Some guy replied that he didn't either. The man thought that there had been a connection quite recently. Is this really his doing? A detachment arrived at the house. Their leader said that a dragon guard operation was underway. All outsiders should disperse. Let them arrest the Sioux family. The whole Sioux family was scared and Ning Bei told Grandma not to worry. They would just be taught a lesson. Nothing would happen. He still needs to visit the Ning family today. Lady Su said it happened 13 years ago. Ning Bei replied that even though 13 years have passed, he will never forget that rainy night. He said goodbye to Grandma and S.C. King and said that he had to go. Lady Su called out to him and said that his mother was not dead. Ning Bei was very surprised and said that she works as a professor at the university. After that, Ning Bei headed forward along the road and reached the Dragon City University. He entered some classroom and saw his mother in a wheelchair. He froze at the entrance and thought that it was really her, she was alive. He sat down at the table and heard a conversation between two students. The girl said that she was so bored she wanted to go outside and play. The guy replied that he wouldn't dare, but she of course could go, it's not for nothing that her father is the vice rector. The girl replied that this was true, but she was still stricter than the other professors. To leave she needs to write a note. The guy replied that she could rise only by creating a reputation for herself as a strict and responsible woman. But he doesn't understand why she's so tense. She is so beautiful, she could make money with her body. If only she weren't completely paralyzed. Ningbei told him to be more respectful to the professor. The guy asked, what does he need? Who is he anyway? He was just thinking about how the old lady could earn extra money. Or is she his mommy? Ningbei suddenly jumped over the table and slammed the guy's head into the table. Then he looked at his mother, and she, calling him by name, asked if it was him. Ningbei approached her, and his mother asked if it was really him. Ningbei confirmed her words, and then they went out into the courtyard of the university. Ningbei's father was sweeping the floor, and his wife called out to him and told him to look who's here. Ningbei called out to his father, and his father called out to him, and they hugged tightly. After that, his father asked why he came back. It's still not safe here. Ningbei told him not to worry. He uses the blade of the Northern King to wash away all the shame and injustice that they had to endure during these 13 years. Ningbei took his mother and suggested that they go home. But suddenly the same girl from the audience appeared behind her and told her father to look. It was he who beat her boyfriend. Her father asked Ningbei's mother who he was. Is it true that he recently beat up a student right in the classroom? He called out to Ningbei's father named Ning Kanlin and asked how they were related to him. Ning Kanlin replied to the vice rector that this was his son. The vice rector asked son. However, he doesn't care whether it's his son or not. He must teach him discipline. Let him not forget who was on his knees begging him for this job. He can fire him at any time. Ning Bei asked his father, was he kneeling? What's happened? His father told him to forget about it. He is from the Ning family. Ning Bei sighed and said, so this is the dog of the Ning family. The vice rector asked who he called the dog. Ning Bei turned around and told him to kneel down. After that, he waved his hand, using his strength, and the shock wave reached the provost's feet. The vice rector fell to his knees, and his daughter asked what he was doing. Ning Bei told his parents that he would make them pay for all the hardships and insults they had suffered over the years. The vice principal's pants were wet, and he said that his legs seemed to be broken. 
after a while, in a residential complex. Ning Bei and his parents walked to the door and Ning Canlin began to open the door. His wife said that he should go grocery shopping and she would cook lunch for their son. Ning Canlin opened the door and told his son to take care of the chair and he would carry his mother downstairs. Ning Bei looked at the stairs to the basement and asked, Is this where they have lived all this time? His father replied that, apart from the humidity, it was quite normal here. Ning Bei called out to Zhang Zhongquan and he said that he was already here. Ning Bei said that he should send people to pick up the things and transport them from here. Zhang Zhongquan listened to him and Ning Bei's mother told him not to worry, they were already used to it. Ning Bei began to grow more expensive with anger and asked how could he forget about this. On that rainy day 13 years ago, they were driven to a dead end, leading to such a sad end. When he returns, he will kill three people. The first is Ning Fukuo. The commanders arrived on the scene, and the guy said that the commander of eastern China had returned. He reports he has the sword of the king of the north. He approached Ning Bei and said that he should let him play with it for a few more days. Ning Bei said that he should stop talking nonsense and give the sword to him. The commander of the east handed him the sword and Ning Bei looked at it, and then told the others that they should keep some distance, he wanted to be with his parents. The commander approached Zhang Zhongquan and asked, When the sword of the king of the north leaves its scabbard, no one can stop it. What kind of person could force the boss to take up the sword? Zhang Zhongquan replied that this must be the real villain. The commander of the east smiled evilly and said that if he did not tell, he would dig up the graves of his ancestors. Zhang Zhongquan replied that the enemy is the Ning family, they are not particularly strong, but this is not a reason for leniency. Time passed, night came. The subordinates of the Ning family announced the gifts coming in. Someone said that the Golden Buddha was presented from the president of the financial corporation Yuan Shen to wish a happy birthday to their patriarch. Mr. Ning gives a hundred-year-old ginseng and sixteen jade bracelets. The head of the Eastern Textile Factory arrived. He gives the patriarch two vases from the Ming Dynasty and wishes him good luck and a long life. Suddenly everyone noticed a funeral procession at the entrance to the estate and the guests asked what was the matter. What kind of funeral procession? How dare they come here? This is a bad sign. The commander of the east said that one iron bell and one old coffin were presented as a gift from an old friend. He threw the bell into the estate grounds and told the people in the funeral procession to cry. They cried and people asked, did I inject? Such an unfavorable sign. They're clearly here to cause trouble. A man from the Ning family stepped forward and asked, do they have some kind of grudge against the Ning family? The commander of the east asked insult. Not at all. This is his first time in the Dragon City. What grievances? He touched the bell and said that, by the way, it is very difficult to find such a large bell on the northern border. But it's not for nothing that their city was the capital of the Ming Dynasty. There really are a lot of relics here. The man thought, northern border? Really? He saw Ning Kanlin and King Hulan, Ning Bei's parents, and thought, so this young man is their son, Ning Bei. Ning Bei walked over and said that Ning Bei, the eldest son of the third generation of the Ning family, had come to wish his second great uncle a long life. Someone asked, Ning Bei, is this the kid who ran away 13 years ago? They say they tried to kill him. The man smiled and said that the elder brother's family had returned. He turned to Ning Bei's mother and said that this chair looked shabby. Maybe he can buy her a new one. Ning Kanlin said it's not worth it. Some guy asked if they had the courage to come back. Let them get out of here. The man told him to watch his tongue. He invited guests into the house and told them to come in and they would talk. He thought that it was not worth publicly pulling family skeletons out of the closets. It's better to finish them off without prying eyes. Ning Bei and his parents headed inside and someone tripped his father. Ning Bei kept his father from falling and some guy, calling Ning Bei's father brother, asked why he was. Today is the patriarch's birthday celebration. He needs to kneel. Ning Kanlin got angry and his son told him to go. They are the main characters of today's performance. They should not be distracted. The commander of the east agreed with him and said that he would take care of this garbage. He took a fighting stance and then threw two swords at the guy's feet. And someone said that this was a unique technique of the northern border. Cold Blade of the North. The man called out to Ning Bei and said that he was going too far. Ning Bei asked, is it too far? Let him forgive him, but he has only just begun. The man got scared and asked what he wanted to do. Ning Bei asked, how about exterminating the Ning family? Meanwhile, the patriarch sat at the round table and thanked all the guests for coming to congratulate him on his birthday. 
The commander of the East and Zhang Zhongquan opened the doors and Ning Bei walked inside with his parents, saying that he wished long life to second grandfather. Everyone was surprised at his presence, and the patriarch said that he was such a good young man, gifted. He thanks him for the congratulations. Some guy came up to Ning Bei and asked, Does that mean he is Ning Bei? Looks like he doesn't even know etiquette. When a representative of the younger generation congratulates the patriarch, he must kneel. The commander of the East asked who he thought he was. Why was he saying such a thing? The guy pointed his finger at himself and asked, Is he telling him? He is Liang Xielong, and in the City of Dragons everyone knows him. No one addresses him without respect. The commander of the East apologized and said with a smile that this was the first time he had heard about him. Some man told Mr. Fair Liang that he didn't know where these insects came from since they didn't even know his name. The commander of the East called Zio Yangshan to him, and he walked up to him. The patriarch asked in surprise, Squad leader Zio? The commander of the East smiled and said that this plump man had insulted him. How will they handle this? Zio Yuncheng looked at the man, and then said that perhaps they should mince him and feed him to the dogs. Zhang Zhongquan approached the commander of the East and told him to stop being a fool. A good lesson for him would be to deprive him of all property, including subsidiaries. Zio Yuncheng obeyed his order, and the man asked in fear, How is this possible? The commander of the East hit Liang Shelong and said that he should not even hope to escape. King Hulun asked her son what did he promise her. Ning Bei immediately called out to the commander of the East and told him to stop playing around and let him move away. The commander of the East listened to him, and the patriarch thought that he did not know where they came from, but apparently they bribed the commander of the Zio detachment to help them. He approached Commander Zio and said that their organization had never interfered in their internal affairs. What has changed today? Ning Bei said that since it was a family matter, they would settle it between themselves. Let everyone who is not related to the Ning family come out. The guests headed towards the exit, and only members of the Ning family remained inside. The patriarch smoothed his beard and asked Ning Bei, it probably wasn't cheap to bribe the squad leader. But now he is gone, who will protect him? The commander of the East smiled and asked, does the old man think that they are nothing without Zio Yuncheng? The patriarch said that he was such a stupid youth. He turned to Kang and said that he should throw these three out of here. Kangu stepped forward and obeyed his grandfather's words. The patriarch said that he didn't think that the Ning family would have their own primary level master. A strong aura began to emanate from Kangu and King Hulan worriedly called out to her son. Kangu rushed forward and said that with this he would sweep them all away. But suddenly he stopped a meter away from Ning Bei and asked why he couldn't move. Ning Bei said let him kneel. Kangu immediately fell to his knees and the patriarch asked what was happening. Kengu said in fear that he was at the level of a god of war. Other family members began to excitedly ask what happened. He didn't even hit him. Did he say he has the level of a god of war? Ning Bei used his power and told them to kneel down. Everyone else also fell to their knees, and the commander of the east said that Ning Bei came to the northern border when he was only seven, and in just a month he reached the rank of warrior. So their fighter is no match for his opponent. The patriarch asked in fear, how is this possible? Commander East approached him and said that Ning Bei reached the level of the god of war at the age of 17. At the same time, he was given the title King of the North, but he refused it, preferring to be called an ordinary person, otherwise they had to address him as King of the North Ning Bei. King Hulan covered her mouth with her hand in shock and asked her son, how much suffering has he endured over the years on the northern border? Ning Bei smiled and replied that he was fine. On that rainy night 13 years ago, his grandfather was killed by them in this very hall, and the fourth uncle was killed with a knife in Ning Kanhai's heart for helping him escape. He saw all this with his own eyes. His grandfather protected him, and his fourth uncle treated him like his own son. If he avenges them, he will not satisfy his hatred. The patriarch said that he was wrong. Let him spare them. Ning Bei grabbed the hilt of his sword and said that Ning Kangu tried to kill him and his mother, so he won't spare anyone either. He pulled the sword out of its sheath and said that if his grandmother from the Sioux family had not saved him, then he might actually have died at their hands that night. There are no innocents in the Ning family. After these words, he plunged the sword into the floor, and the patriarch, looking at the shining blade, said that this is karma. He quickly ran to the sword and tried to pull it out, but he couldn't and asked why he felt like the sword was embedded in the ground. Ning Bei laughed and said that the sword of the King of the North weighs 360 kilograms, he simply cannot lift it. He raised his sword and cut the patriarch's throat. 
The man called out to his father in fear and then rushed towards Ningbe and said that he would fight him to the death. But he ran into Ningbe's sword and also died. Ningbe said that fourth uncle can now rest in peace. The rest of the family looked at the corpses in fear and Ningbe told Ning Kang that he would kneel here for the rest of his life to feel his father's humiliation and his mother's pain. He turned to his father and said that all the property of the Ning family was now his because initially it was he who was supposed to become the head of the family. His father couldn't find the words to answer and Ning Bei told his mother that he wanted to visit the fourth uncle's grave, let them wait for him here. Ning Bei walked out of the building and Mu Cheng threw a cloak over him. They went outside the estate and saw a car arrive and Lu Gui asked who was there. An old man got out of the car and said that he wanted to look at the young man who was abandoned by the Ning family 13 years ago. He wants to see how strong he has become since he dared to injure the eldest grandson of the Liang family. Lu Gui stepped forward and said that he would clear the way. Guo Beifang stopped him and said that they should not draw their sword. They are in the Dragon City, not on the northern border. There are no foreign invaders here. Another car arrived and the man told the old man that it was the Su family's car. Lady Su and Su King had got out of the car and the old man asked what they were doing here. The man called the old man father and said that the Sioux family had long been weakened, they had no need to fear this old woman. His father replied that although the Sioux family has weakened, they have a strong foundation. Even after the death of this woman, they will survive. Lady Sioux asked, did they come to wish happiness to the patriarch of the Ning family? The old man replied that this is not so. Who is he anyway? He is the killer of his own older brother, so that he can also congratulate him. He pointed his finger at Ning Bei and said that this person from the Ning family injured his eldest grandson. He wants their so-called patriarch to answer for this. Yang Shailong looked out of the car and said that he was the one who hit him. The commander of the East asked, Do they need patriarch Ning Fukuo? It won't be easy to get answers from him, unless of course they are necromancers. The old man asked in surprise, Is he dead? Today is the celebration of his 80th birthday. Is he really dead? The commander of the east replied with a smile that death is such a thing, it can creep up at any moment. Lady Su turned to Mr. Yang and said that he should let her settle the matter with his grandson. It's raining, they should go home. The old man thought, Ning Fukuo has passed away, and Lady Su advises him to leave. What's going on here anyway? And it still remains a mystery where this boy from the Ning family came from. This whole thing looks dangerous. He coughed into his fist and said that this was the case. Liang Shailong called out to his grandfather and asked if he would leave it like this. The man turned to his father and said that by hitting Shailong, he had struck a blow to the whole family. Lady Su told Mr. Ying to think carefully. Their family accumulated their wealth for more than a century. They don't want only six of the seven great families of Dragon City to remain. The old man thanked Lady Su for her participation, but for one attack on his eldest grandson, someone must answer. The commander of the East asked what he was up to. What about? Ning Bei silenced him with one gesture and said that the one they were looking for was his younger brother, and he will not give it to anyone. Silence reigned between them and a few seconds later the old man called out to Fado. Fado came forward and said that he was Liang Fado. Su King called out to Ning Bei and told him to be careful. This is the fourth most powerful fighter in their city. Lady Su told her not to worry. Ning Bei said that he would always protect her, and he would definitely keep his word. Ming Bei told Su King that today he would show her the differences in levels between martial artists. First come the students. Fighters at this level are not much different from ordinary people. Next come primary level fighters like him. They are already noticeably stronger than ordinary people. Next come the rank of warrior, general, and finally god of war. The hallmark of the god of war is a powerful aura that can suppress an entire army. He used his aura and told Su King that he said that he would always protect her, and he was not lying. Su King looked at him with a smile, and he said that he should also mention that there were more than a hundred war gods under his command on the northern border. Ning Bei's aura terrified Liang Fado, and Ning Bei said that there are also differences among the war gods. He is now the strongest in the garrison of the northern border. He is the king of the north. Ning Bei extended his hand forward and struck Liang Fado, throwing him back. He spat out blood from his mouth and Ning Kanlin said that he didn't know Uncle Yang was here. He asks for forgiveness for not meeting them properly. Mr. Yang asked in surprise, did he return to the Ning family? Ning Kanlin told him that his son was not very familiar with etiquette. Since they decided to visit them, then they need to open the main hall and celebrate this. Let them come in, Mr. Yang said that his etiquette is much better. 
They headed to the estate and went inside. Mr. Yang thought that he didn't think there were so many fighters inside. What is the Ning family up to? Suddenly he saw Ning Kangu kneeling and thought, isn't he one of the three who runs everything here? He's also a strong martial artist, but he was still brought to his knees. Suddenly he saw blood and thought that he should have listened to old Lady Su. There have been big changes in the Ning family. So what is he doing here? Ning Bei seated Grandma in a place of honor, and Mr. Nang sat down nearby. Lady Su told Su King that she should go and find Aunt King. Mr. Yang asked Ning Kanlin, so he returned to the Ning family. Lady Su said that not only has he returned, he is now the new head of the Ning family. Mr. Price Liang was silent and surprised, and then Ning Kanglin said that he has no special talents, so he hopes for his support. Let him allow him to introduce Ning Bei, the eldest son in the third generation. Mr. Liang said that he was glad to meet a worthy young man. Lady Su told Mr. Yang that the younger generation of their family had many promising young men, like Xie Long and others. Mr. Yang told her not to joke like that. Compared to young Ningbei, they are a disgrace to the family. He got up from his chair and said that they had a good time, drank tea, and now it was time for them to go home, it was getting late. He said goodbye to them and went outside, and then said that the discarded son of the Ning family has returned, more changes await Dragon City. Ning Bei also left the house, and his father said that it was late. Where is he going? Ning Bei replied that he still wanted to visit the grave. He would return soon. He came to the cemetery and saw two destroyed graves of his family members. Thunder roared, and Ning Bei said that they needed to investigate now. Immediately after this, Zhang Zhongquan burst into the guard room, and the man asked who they were. What do they need? Zhang Zhongquan said two graves in the northeastern part of the cemetery have been destroyed. Who took the ashes of Ning Kanan and Ning Kanchen? The man got scared and replied that he didn't know. Zhang Zhongquan took out his sword and asked, doesn't he know? The man fell to his knees in front of them and asked him not to kill him. It was a young couple seven years ago. Zhang Zhongquan asked, it was seven years ago, but did he remember it? The man started crying and said that they paid him 100,000 to keep quiet. Zhang Zhongquan said that let him tell everything in detail and get as much more. Time passed. Zhang Zhongquan returned to the cemetery and Ning Bei asked, did he find out what happened? Zhang Zhongquan replied that seven years ago, a young couple, a man and a woman, took the ashes from the grave. The watchman gave their description. Ning Bei said that let the artists draw their portraits, and when they find them, then let them not regret them. Zhang Zhongquan listened to him, and Ning Bei said that Mu Chang should use his influence in northern China to achieve his goals faster. He turned around and told everyone else that they were coming back. After some time, Ning Bei's father sat in his office and sighed heavily. Ning Bei went inside and said that he should rest. His father looked up at him and said that he had finally returned. Ning Bei walked over and asked, Is there something wrong with the Ning family's finances? His father replied that this was putting it mildly. The family business was poorly run, the family has one billion in debt, and the company's shares are pledged. Ming Bei said that he should let him deal with it. Su King rolled his mother to the table, and she told her son that he should not shoulder all the problems of the Ning family. Ning Bei looked at Su King and asked, Did she decide to stay here? She replied that her grandmother asked to stay and talk to Aunt King. Ning Bei's mother told him not to worry about it, let him let his father handle everything. Ning Bei smiled and told her not to worry, it was nothing. He called somewhere and someone answered that the president was on vacation now, let him call back tomorrow after 9 a.m. Ning Bei said let him wake up. Let them say that an ordinary person on the northern frontier is asking him and let him call back immediately. Ning Bei's mother smiled and said that he was asking for help a little rudely. His father asked who he called. Ning Bei replied that he was calling an acquaintance. He left his phone in the office and said that he would go to the kitchen to have a snack for bedtime. Su King looked after him and said that his behavior was so terrible. How can you be so spoiled? She doubts that anyone will want to help if he asks like that. Suddenly Ning Bei's phone started ringing and Su King asked, Is someone calling? They actually called back. Ning Kanlin said it was a video call. Su King saw the man's image on the screen and said that it was Kaio Roman 11. He is the richest man in the world. Ning Kanlin thought, the richest man in the world. And Ning Bei was just talking about him? Ning Kanlin answered the call and Kaio Roman 11 asked if he could find out who he was. Ning Kanlin replied that his son Ning Bei just called him. He's gone now. If he's not busy, he'll tell him to call back later. To Kaio Roman 11, he replied that he was completely free. 
Ning Bei came into the room and his father told him to come in quickly. Mr. Kaio is calling him. Ning Bei took the phone and Kaio Roman 11 addressed him as his majesty and Ning Bei said that let him just call him by name. Now he is at home. Kaio Roman 11 called him Commander Ning and said that his phone was not at hand, otherwise he would have answered immediately. Ning Bei told him not to worry, he was only calling to remind him of the favor he owed him. Kaio Roman 11 said that three years ago he saved his family. If he needs any help, he's ready. Su King was surprised and thought that now she understood why he was so respectful. Ning Bei saved his life. Ning Bei said that he would need some money. He turned to his father and asked how much he needed to pay off his debts. His father was slightly surprised and then said that the family had large debts, 8 billion in principal and several short-term ones. He wanted to say something else, but Kaio Roman 11 interrupted him and said that he would give them 10 billion, although this is not even close to what Mr. Gizaning did for his family. Ning Bei asked his father, is 10 billion enough? Kaio Roman 11 said that if not, he can add another 10 billion dollars. Su King asked in surprise dollars? Ning Kanlin asked, was this the first time he talked about dollars? This is too large an amount, if you count in dollars, they need no more than 2 billion. Kaio Roman 11 asked in surprise, only 2 billion? Ning Kanlin confirmed his words and said that of course, their family would return the money to him once they deal with the current difficulties. Kaio Roman 11 said that he should consider it a gift, Nothing needs to be returned. Ning Kanlin apologized and said that this was too much money. They couldn't accept it as a gift. He ended the call and said that Mr. Kayo is such a generous and sincere person. Ning Bei thought, generous and sincere. He's just a cunning businessman who wants him to remain in his debt. Ning Bei told his father that since he was satisfied, then everything was fine. They could go to bed. He took his mother to the office exit and asked Su King. She has a test tomorrow, right? She asked how he knew this. Ning Bei said that she should go to bed early and he would give her a lift tomorrow. The next morning at the gates of the educational institution, Ning Bei drove Su King to the gate and the man told her that they had arrived. Su King's friend came to the car and asked, is she in the Ning family's car? Who gave her a lift? Ning Bei rolled down the window and Su King's friend said that he was so handsome. Who is this? Su King smiled embarrassedly and wanted to answer something, but her friend said that she understood. This must be Ning Bei, her betrothed. She is right? Su King asked. What is she saying? Her friend called out to Ning Bei and asked what university he was studying at. Su King told her not to ask about this. He doesn't study anywhere. Ning Bei replied that he really didn't go to an ordinary university, but he did attend Baoyang Military Academy. Does this count? Some guy heard this and asked, Baoyang Military Academy? Did he study there? Su King's friend called him Du Yong and asked, Does he know this academy? Some other guy approached them and said that this is a third-rate academy. They can only deceive people with such a name. Du Yong said that this is nonsense. His brother studied there, and he is not incredible. The guy walked past him and said that it means his brother is the hope of their village. Praise to their ancestors that he was able to get into this academy for idiots. That's better. Du Yong became angry and Ning Bei decided to get out of the car. Su King thought that this was bad. It would not be good if he got into a fight again. She walked up to Ning Bei and asked why he came out. Wasn't he in a hurry to get home? Ning Bei smiled and asked why she was sending him out. The guy gritted his teeth in irritation and thought that he had been courting Su King as for a long time. Where did this groom come from? He asked Ning Bei. Is his name Ning Bei? He is Xi Zhengxiang. He apologizes, but he has never heard of Baoyang Military Academy. Ning Bei smirked and Xi Zhengxiang thought he was an asshole. Ning Bei said that all the idiots don't need to know about the existence of the military academy. Su King's friend asked, does he mean her? Su King told her to ignore him. He was definitely not talking about her. Du Yong said that the Baoyang Military Academy is an educational institution where officers are admitted after 16 years of age and, after five years of training, graduate officers. This place can be considered the birthplace of great generals. Shi Zhengxiang asked Ning Bei, what is his rank in this academy? Ning Bei replied that it was nothing special, an ordinary person. Shi Zhengxiang smiled and said that he thought that he would dare to impersonate a military officer. But is he just a clown fooling them? The university students? Du Yang asked in surprise, is he an ordinary person? Su King exclaimed that Ning Bei did not lie and would definitely not fool someone like him. Let him stop making a scene here. Ning Bei told Su King that she thought too highly of him if she thought he would hurt him. Let her go to class, and in the afternoon he will pick her up. Su King asked, 
Where is he going now? Ningbei smiled and replied that he would go kill someone. All the students in the area were scared, and Shi Zhengxiang laughed and said that he was a crazy fool. The smile disappeared from Ningbei's face, and Su King, noticing this, said that he promised Ant King that he would not fight with anyone. Ningbei replied that he knew. He asked Shi Zhengxiang, so he is from the Shi family. Shi Zhengxiang asked, so he knows his family. Then he must realize that they are not someone worth messing with. Let him stay away from Su King. Ningbei opened the car door and said that he should tell Shi Quanjia that he, Ningbei, is waiting for them at 8 o'clock today. Shi Zhengxiang asked who he thinks he is. Does he think his older uncle will want to date him? Let him get checked by a psychiatrist. Ningbei began to get angry and then pushed Shi Zhengxiang and he fell to the ground, clutching his sore shoulder. Su King covered her face with her hand and thought that he was on his own again. After that, Ningbei left and came home. He went up to his mother and said that he was home. She called out to him and, looking at Ning Kangu, told him to listen to her. He was his uncle after all. He's been on his knees all night. Maybe he'll let him go already. Ning Bei told her not to worry about it. This man was trying to kill them, so he wouldn't get off easy. And the next person he will kill will be King Fen, Will she tried to stop him. His mother remained silent and Ning Bei remembered moments from his childhood. His mother knocked on the estate doors and begged them to take Ning Bei. She is ready to die, but let them protect his son. Then Ning Bei touched his mother's hand and his father told his mother to stop. They need to leave. They are getting close. Second uncle got out of the car and told Ning Bei's mother to stop begging them. They need to leave. Ning Bei's mother didn't listen to him and said that no matter what happens, she is still part of the king family. They don't want to help her. She begs them. Second uncle began to lead her away from the gate. But at that very second, the gate opened and someone swung a blade, injuring second uncle Ning Bei. Ning Bei's father called out to Ning Cannon, and a member of the King family appeared at the gate. Now Ning Bei drove up to that same gate, and the people at the entrance said that this was the Ning family's car. And which of them came? The man replied that it didn't matter. Let him quickly open the door and inform the butler that a member of the Ning family had arrived. The gate opened and Ning Bei drove inside and said that he remembers how on that rainy night, the red doors of his grandfather's house remained tightly closed. King Hulan remembered Ning Cannon and became upset. The car drove up to the doorstep of the house, and the man said that they had already arrived, but they weren't getting out of the car. Ning Bei opened the window slightly and said that he was waiting for the head of the house to personally open the door for him. Everyone was surprised to hear Ning Bei's words, and someone asked who he was. The voice is young, isn't it too much? The man smiled and said that he would open it. Suddenly, a member of the King family saw Ning Bei's parents inside the car and asked, Is it them? King Hulan called him second brother, and he said that he is not her brother. She has long ceased to be part of their family. The man said, Let them throw them out. What luck! He already thought it was Ning Kanhai. Ning Bei got out of the car and asked why they were in such a hurry to drive them away. Do they feel guilty? The man asked, Who else is he? Their King family is one of the seven richest families playing the biggest role in Dragon City so they don't feel guilty about dating anyone. Ming Bei's father got out of the car and asked, really? He handed the envelope to his wife's second brother, and he asked what he was giving him there. Ning Kanlin called him a fool and said that he should read it first. He led his wife and said that they were going inside. Second brother King Hulan was surprised to see the contents of the envelope, and the woman who came up to him called him tension and asked what was in there. He replied to his daughter-in-law that this was a contract with the Ning conglomerate. The man was surprised and asked where they got their contract from. Ning Kanlin turned around and said that when they read it, let them go inside and sign the clause of breaking the contract. King Tencheng asked, what did he just say? Does he even know how much their family has invested in this business? All the resources of the King family are invested in this contract. How can he ask them to break this contract? Ning Kanlin asked, he asks how. He's the head of a conglomerate, isn't that enough? King Tencheng said that this is impossible. The head of the Ning conglomerate is Ning Kanhai. Would he have given up his place to him? He took out his phone and said that he would ask him what was going on. He called him and Ning Bei looked at him with a smile. King Tencheng didn't get through to him and the man asked, what's wrong? King Tencheng replied that he was not answering. He would call Ning Fuguo. He called him and asked why no one was answering. The man said that then he should call Ning Kang. King Tencheng called Ning Kang and he picked up the phone. King Tencheng asked what was going on there. Ning Kangu did not answer and asked, did he come to them? King Tencheng asked who. Ning Kangu called Ning Bei's name and said that this was the boy 13 years ago. Let them not provoke him if they do not want to die. 
After that, he dropped the call and King Tenshin asked what could scare him so much, one of the ten strongest fighters in the city. Ning Kanlin told him to sign the contract break. King Tenshin remained silent, and then a woman approached King Hulan and said that they were a family. She must convince her husband not to condemn their family to bankruptcy. King Hulan asked, Is it too late to regret now? Ning Kanlin said that when he and Hulan got married, he used all the resources of the Ning family to raise their family from a small company to one of the seven great families. Now he takes back what he borrowed. A guy came inside and told King Tencheng to sign it. The man turned around and called him third brother. Ning Bei frowned and called out his name, King Fen. The man asked King Feni what he meant. King Fen asked, doesn't he know that the Ning family itself is not in the best condition right now? They invested more than 10 billion in the new area and suffered big losses. They are now under great pressure and will not survive without them. The new district is sucking up money like a swamp. It will be for the best if they get out of business in time. But what was bought belongs to them, so he asks to give it back. Ning Kanlin replied that he knew they would say that. Everything that belongs to them has already been taken into account. The King family members took a closer look at the contract, and then King Fen said that they were exploiters. Ning Kanlin replied that that's right, today they have come to punish them. The man said that they invested more than six billion, but the profit from these two small projects is hardly two billion. King Fen said that he should sign it. The man asked, was he also mad? King Fen said that the Liang family is willing to become a shareholder. When all three projects are completed, it will be enough to pay off the bank loan, after which their family will be restored. The man said he would sign it. After that, he signed the contract and Ning Kanlin received a call from someone. He handed the phone to his son and said it was Kaio Roman 11. Ning Bei smiled and said that he should answer him. The man thought in surprise, Kaio Roman 11. Is he really the richest man in the world? It's impossible that they knew each other. Ning Kanlin answered the call and Kaio Roman 11 asked, he hopes he is not distracting him. Ning Kanlin replied that everything was fine. Does he have something to do? Kaio Roman 11 confirmed his words and said that the board of directors unanimously voted to invest in the Ning family. Ning Kanlin was surprised and Kaio Roman 11 said that they were ready to invest $10 billion in the Ning conglomerate for 10% shares. What will he say to this? King Fenny was very surprised when he heard this and Ning Kanlin asked again, 10 billion for 10% of the shares. It's like a gift from heaven. But is this really normal? Ming Bei said that 10% is too much. Kaio Roman 11 and the others immediately stood up when they heard Ning Bei's voice and Kaio Roman 11 called him the King of the North. King Fen asked, King of the North. The man asked what he was talking about. Who is this anyway? Kaio Roman 11 asked when how about 5%? One of the directors said that they would agree to even 1%. Ning Kanlin agreed and Kaio Roman 11 said that then they will do so. The deal is done. Ning Bei smiled and thought that the main thing was that his father was happy. Kaio Roman 11 ended the call and said that they had made a deal. Money and shares don't matter. The main thing is that now they have an official connection with the King of the North. Meanwhile, the man from the King family asked, Do they think they can defeat the King family like this? In their opinion, money is everything. They don't know about the existence of martial artists. Ning Bei replied that their King Fen seemed to be one of those. He turned to his father and said that he should take his mother and take a walk for a while. Ning Kanlin and King Hulan glanced at each other, and then Ning Bei used his aura. Everyone immediately fell to their knees in front of him, feeling his strong aura, and Ning Bei asked, Martial artist? Do they think he doesn't understand this at all? King Tenchang thought that now he understood why Ning Kangu said that he should not be provoked. Ning Bei turned around, and then King Fen arose to his feet and took out his blade from under his clothes. Immediately after this, he rushed towards Ning Bei and raised his blade over him, but at the last moment he stopped and was unable to strike. Ning Bei turned around and asked, this is how he killed his second uncle. Just to do a favor for the Ning family, he shamefully attacked Ning Cannon from behind and killed him. He extended his hand forward and told him to die. Immediately afterwards, Ning Bei's power pierced King Fen's chest, and he retreated back, and then fell dead and Ning Bei left. The man cried and said that he was the god of war, the god of war of the northern garrison. Meanwhile, a car drove up to the house, and the guy at the entrance said that Su King Hui had arrived. Ning Kanlin smiled and said, Here comes King Hui. Su King Hui called out to Aunt King and said that he had brought them a gift. Ning Kanlin smiled and asked, What are the gifts for? He's not a stranger. Su King Hui smiled and said that he wanted it that way. King Hulan asked, 
Did he come to see Ningbei? Then they will go and let them talk. Su King Hui said goodbye to them, and then he and Ningbei were left alone. Ningbei pointed to a chair and told him to sit down. Does the Su family have any problems? Su King Hui sat on the chair and replied that although the Su family is not as strong as before, they will not rely on outsiders. He can handle their problems himself, and the Ning family is now in almost the same difficult situation. Ningbei smiled and thought that Su King Hui was a strong fellow, not like the rest of the Su family. Su King Hui put the bank card on the table and said that 300,000,000 is all he can offer, but it will be enough for the Ning family to overcome the crisis. The only condition is to break the engagement with Su King. Move the bank card closer to Ning Bei, and he, placing the glass on the table with a crash, decided to say goodbye to him. He walked towards the exit, and Su King Hui said that he knows that he is a very strong martial artist, but he spent most of his life in the northern garrison. He doesn't even know what Su King likes. He doesn't know anything, so she won't be happy if she marries him. Ning Bei asked, so why is he turning the engagement into a trade? Su King Hui asked, what's wrong? This is initially a marriage of convenience. A subordinate entered the room and told Ning Bei that someone was looking for him. Ning Bei said, let this person come in. A woman entered the room and greeted his majesty, the king of the north. Su King Hui was surprised and thought, king of the north? The woman said her name was Mu Roman Eleven. She was the president of the Asian branch of PG. She received a message from the head of Kaio Roman Eleven. They are ready to transfer $10 billion to the Ning conglomerate. Su King Hui was very surprised and thought, President of the Asian branch? Ten billion? Ning Bei turned to his subordinate and said that he should take her to her father to sign the contract. He listened to him and Ning Bei said that he was not interested in money. If he needed them, many would gladly give anything. The wedding was organized by his father's generation. If they have something to say, then let Granny Su come to him. Su King Hui was very surprised by his words, then Ning Bei settled down in the office and thought that the Su family was willing to pay a considerable amount for the breakup without hesitation. What were they planning? They certainly don't care about Su King's welfare. One of the Blades of the North entered the office and asked permission to report. Ning Bei asked, did they find those who stole the ashes of second uncle and fourth uncle? The guy replied that the captain sent him, they did not find the kidnappers. Ning Bei squeezed the glass in his hand in anger, and the guy, getting down on one knee, said that there was nothing about the ashes, but their people in Luo City passed on secret information. They found traces of the fourth elder Ning. Ning Bei slammed his palm on the table and asked in surprise, is fourth uncle alive? The guy confirmed his words and replied that so far they had only found traces of him. Ning Bei said that they should contact Luo City and let all their people search. The guy obeyed him and left, and Ning Bei thought, is fourth uncle really alive? Time passed, Ning Bei went somewhere by car and told Zio Yunchang to be faster. They got stuck in a traffic jam and Zio Yunchang started honking his horn, asking what happened there. There was a man sitting in a truck standing in the next row. He told Zio Yunchang to stop honking, it's useless. He drives this route every day. He always gets stuck here for two or three hours. Zio Yuncheng looked out of the car window, and Ning Bei said that they should send a helicopter. Zio Yuncheng replied that he was on a mission nearby. Ning Bei said that let them pick him up. He will help them finish faster. Zio Yangchen agreed, after which a helicopter appeared on the road, and surprised people began to wonder what was happening. Why is there a helicopter here? The man threw the ladder out of the helicopter, and Ning Bei and Zio Yongshin got out of the car and climbed onto the ladder, after which the helicopter flew away. They flew over the forest and stopped in a huge clearing. Ning Bei got off the helicopter and asked, What is the situation? Some guy asked who he was. Zio Yuncheng told his subordinates not to evade the answer. The guy immediately saluted him and said that they had arrived to check a message about missing people. In this area, they were attacked by a beast. Zio Yuncheng called him Kobayashi and asked, Is he already at the primary level? An ordinary beast should not have been able to wound him. The other guy answered the commander that this beast is extremely ferocious. It moves at a speed of about 10 meters per second. It must be at the level of a warrior. They are not its opponents. Zio Yuncheng said that let them take care of the injured person. They will sort it out. Ning Bei said that he was afraid. It was too late to retreat. They were being watched. He looked to the side and someone quickly moved in the bushes. The guy looked around and told them to look, it was there. Another guy asked where it went. The guy said that the beast was too fast, he didn't notice it. Zio Yuncheng said that it is definitely somewhere nearby. 
Some girl and a guy came up to them and told them to stop. Are all the fighters in Dragon City so useless? The guy told his little sister not to say anything stupid. She asked, but is she telling the truth? They are so weak that they cannot cope with the beast. Zayo Yuncheng asked who is it. His subordinate replied that her name was Liu Linner. She was the granddaughter of Liu Lao, a famous doctor from the Central Plains. When she was collecting medicinal herbs on the mountain, she encountered a beast, and Zayo Ling was injured while saving her. Brother Liu Linger turned to Commander Zayo and said that his sister was a little rude, so he apologized for causing trouble. She asked how can he say such a thing. Ning Bei looked at the girl and said that in her basket there was a century-old law that could relieve pain. Liu Linner covered the bag with her hands and asked what he wanted. She was looking for this grass for a long time. Ning Bei frowned and then told her to get out of here. Liu Linner asked indignantly who is he to tell her. Ning Bei replied that since she thought they were useless, she could go on her own. She replied that there was a beast there, they must protect her. Zayo Yunqing said that their task is to kill the beast, not to protect them, let them go. Liu Linner noticed the gaze of Zayo Yangshan's subordinates, and he said that Mr. Gu Liu has been practicing medicine for many years. To have such a descendant is a disgrace to his family. Liu Linner's brother told her that it was her fault that they were driven away. She told him to stop talking. They left and Zayo Yangshan said that she was still Dr. Liu's granddaughter if something happened to him. Suddenly Ning Bei heard something and a beast jumped out in front of Liu Linner and her brother. A huge black panther stood in their way and Liu Linner began to beg for help. The panther slowly approached and Liu Linner trembled in fear. Then the panther jumped and Zayo Yunchang was scared. But at that same second a leaf flew past him at high speed and pierced the panther's head, killing it. The panther's corpse fell in front of Liu Linner, and her brother approached her. Zayo Yuncheng looked at Ning Bei, who released the same leaf, and the guy asked, Did he just throw the first leaf he came across? Another guy said he was a real god of war. Ning Bei walked towards the helicopter and said that the mission is completed. Zayo Yuncheng is going with him to Liu City, and let the rest return to Dragon City. Zayo Yuncheng called Ning Bei the commander and agreed. The guys looked after him, and one of them asked, Commander. He wonders if it is Lu Gui or Guo Beifan. His friend replied that he was not one of them. Although he doesn't know it, only one person can wear clothes with a gold-plated killin. The one who can command all five commanders. The helicopter's propeller began to work, and they rose into the air. After that, Ning Bei and Zayo Yunsheng arrived at the headquarters. Zayo Yangshan turned on the video monitors in front of Ning Bei and said that Ning Kanshin was alive. He pressed a button on the remote control and said this is what they found. On one of the monitors an image of Ning Kanshin appeared, selling sweets on a bicycle. Ning Bei saw his face and said that this is the fourth uncle. Meanwhile, Ning Kanshin was walking along a shopping street and a woman asked him, is he selling candied hawthorn? Ning Kanshin smiled and replied that some money would be useful in the household. The woman said that last time her son recommended him a job, but he did not show up for the interview. Ning Kanshin's wife looked out of the house and told Mrs. Si Zhao that his health left much to be desired, so they shouldn't bother. Messers, Zhao took out an envelope and said that her husband asked me to give this to them. Their child needs to pay for his studies. Ning Kanshin's wife waved her hands and said that they couldn't accept it. Ning Kanshin smiled and told Madame Zhao that they didn't even return the money they dealt with last time. Imar Zhao put an envelope in their hands and told them not to worry about it. Ning Kanshin's wife looked at her daughter and said that she should thank Auntie. Her daughter thanked Aunt Zhao and she said that she was such a good girl. Suddenly bandits appeared on the shopping street and one of them said that it was already the end of the month. Did they pay the water bills? The merchant called him Liang and then handed him an envelope and said that here was his payment. Liang looked at Ning Kanshin and asked what about him. Ning Kanshin smiled and replied that he could not collect such a sum so quickly. Liang hit his bicycle, and it fell to the ground. The candied hawthorn scattered on the ground, and Liang told Ning Kanshin not to whine about poverty here. This will not reduce the tax. Suddenly, Ning Kanshin's daughter ran up to Liang and pushed him, saying that he should not offend her dad. Liang hit her and told her to go away. Ning Kanshin's wife called out to her daughter Gu Guo and began to calm him down, telling her not to cry. Gu Guo cried and said that they were hurting her dad. Ning Kanshin clenched his hands into fists in rage, and one of the bandits pointed his finger at the envelope and told Liang to take a look. Here is the money. Liang pointed his finger at Ning Kanshin and asked, Did he want to stash the money? He will tear him to pieces. Ning Kanshin called out to his wife, King, and told her to take their daughter home. Liang asked what the hell. 
Does he want to fight? Ning Kanshin suddenly approached Liang and grabbed his arm, causing him to back away and grab his sore arm. Ning Kanshin said that they can attack him. He is a man who couldn't even protect his daughter-in-law and dear nephew on that distant day. But today they hurt his family. They have already suffered so much. For this they will die. The bandits took out weapons and told him to shut his mouth. He was the one who was going to die. Immediately after, Ning Kanshin hit the two of them, and they both fell to the ground. Liang got scared, and then began to run and said that he would not leave it like that. Ning Kanshin started coughing up blood and King called out to him in concern. Gugu ran to her father, and the man said that they needed to take him to the house. Let them call an ambulance. Gugu called her dad, and King asked if he was okay. Members of the Northern Blades appeared on the street, and Ning Kanshin told King to take Guguo and run. Mrs. Zhao asked, what is he saying? If they are bad people, then they should call the police. Ning Kanshin replied that he was afraid that not all cases could be solved by the police. Let them go home. They shouldn't mess with them. They are not some bandits. They are real killers. He stood up and said that Ning Fukuo did a good job, even involving the Special Operations Department in his assassination. Well, he, Ning Kanshin, is ready to fight them. One of the Northern Blades asked, Is his name Ning Kanshin? Ning Kanshin replied that he had been hiding for many years, but it was true, he was Ning Kanshin, the person they were assigned to kill. The guys greeted the fourth elder and said that they were Wang Long and Chen, who from the Central China Association. Ning Kanshin asked in surprise, What are they talking about? Wang Lung said that the commander ordered the search for fourth elder Ning. Ning Kanshin realized that they were not Ning Fukuo's people and began to lose consciousness. Chen who caught him and Wang Long said that they need to call the best doctors in the city. After that, several doctors arrived at Ning Kanshin's house and began to examine him. The doctor said that his pulmonary arteries were damaged and there was nothing they could do to help him. Chen who exclaimed, they can't help him, they will finish them off now. Wang Lung said let him say so. The doctor asked, does he think he doesn't want to treat him? What's the point of trying to threaten him? Do they think this will make the dying person feel better? Chen who got angry and Dr. Liu told the other doctor not to blame the young man for his anger. They declare death wherever they go. He called out to his grandson and said that he should give him his silver needles. Ning Bei entered the room with Zio Yongshen and Wang Long told them that it was Dr. Liu. Dr. Liu walked towards Ning Kanshin and then raised his hand and sharply touched Ning Kanshin's face and chest. Ning Kanshin felt relieved and thanked the doctor. He saved him. Doctor, Liu told him not to rush to thank him. He's afraid he can't do anything about his old wounds. It can only prolong his life a little. The deadline is three days. In his situation, even God would find it difficult to save his life. Chen Hu noticed Zio Yunsheng and greeted the commander. Ning Bei took off his cloak and Ning Kanshin, seeing him, wanted to ask who he was, but Ning Bei did not let him finish, and, calling him fourth uncle, said that it was him. Ning Kanshin pointed his finger at him in surprise and asked, Is he Ning Bei? Ning Bei hugged his uncle and Ning Kanshin was happy and wanted to ask something, but Ning Bei said that he would tell about everything later. Now his wound needs to be healed. Doctor. Liu asked, Does he want to treat his wound? Did he hear himself? His needles can extend his life by three days. That's the maximum. Ning Bei replied that he originally wanted to look at the legendary doctor's skill. He pointed his finger at his uncle's chest and asked, Is this a skill? Now he will show you how to do it right. He took Dr. Liu's needles and said that even the king of the underworld couldn't take away someone close to him. The doctor asked who he was. With such skills, he is definitely one of the best in the country. Doctor. Liu was surprised and said that he controls the needles with Kai. Several needles began to float around Ning Kanshin's body and then stuck into it, and Dr. Liu said in surprise that these were seven ghost gate needles. Reversal of the pulmonary arteries. Who is he? Ning Bei ignored him and told his uncle to let the needles stay in his body. In seven days he can pull them out, by then everything will be fine. Ning Kanshin agreed, and then Ning Bei put on his cloak and Dr. Liu said in surprise that he had a golden killin cloak. He is the king of the north. Ning Bei came out of the house and Ning Kanshin's wife asked what happened to him. Ning Bei replied that fourth uncle was fine and needed some rest. He walked up to Guo Guo and asked, does she know who he is? King told her to say hello. This is her older brother Ning Bei. Gu Guo asked, is he her brother Ning Bei? But her dad said that he had gone far, far away. She knows that's what they say about those who die. Ning Bei stroked her cheek and said that he was not dead. He was just really far away. What's wrong with her face? She replied that her bad bald uncle hit her, and he even hit her dad. 
Ming Bei looked at Zhao Yunsheng and said let them find him and kill him. Zhao Yunsheng listened to him and some time passed from that moment. A gang of bandits approached Ming Kanchen's house and one of them asked where all these doctors were coming from. He called out to Liang and asked who injured him. They'll break his arms. The gang approached Ming Bei and the others and Liang, pointing to Ning Kanchen's wife, said that this woman was with him. Ning Bei took off his cloak and then threw it over King and Gu Guo and took out his sword. At the same moment, he cut off Liang's hand and asked who is next. The guy said in fear that he was from the Axe Gang. Zhao Yuncheng slapped him in the face and asked, why should anyone care where he is from? Ning Bei covered Gu Guo's eyes and called out to Zhao Yuncheng and then said that he should let him cripple them. Zhao Yuncheng listened to him and got down to business. After that, Ning Kanchen was escorted to the car, and Mrs. Zhao said that she guessed that old man Ning's family was not simple, but she didn't think it was that much. The merchant said that Ning Roman Eleven must have been hiding here from his enemies. But now it seems that all the troubles are behind us. One of the northern blades approached Mrs. Zhao and handed her an envelope, saying that this was the money that the fourth elder borrowed from them. Mrs. Zhao refused and the guy, pointing to the suitcase with the money, said that it was a gift from the commander as a sign of gratitude. Mrs. Atha Zhao was very surprised and took the suitcase and the merchant said that good deeds are always rewarded. The other man said that she had been taking care of Ning Zai's family for so long and it turned out that it was not in vain. Time passed. Ning Bei was driving with his uncle and his family in the car and Gu Gu asked, So is he really her brother Ning Bei? Ning Bei replied that it was him the one and only. Ning Kenshin said that when his chest was pierced with a sword, everyone thought that he would die. But few people knew that he was born with a heart displaced to the right. He took his wife's hand and said that Su King secretly saved him, since then they have been hiding together. For his sake, she had not contacted her family all this time. She smiled and said that it was her choice. Why bring up this topic? Ning Bei told his uncle that he should use his real name. He was his idol as a child. A decisive and bright fourth uncle, overwhelming everyone in his generation with his intelligence and strength. Ning Kanchen laughed and said that it was so long ago, why remember it now? However, he promises, when they return home, he will drop the name Ning Roman Eleven and go back to being called Ning Kanchen. Sometime later, Su King stands at the entrance to the courtyard and tells Ning Bei that he is a deceiver. She waited for an hour and a half, since he promised to come for her. He got out of the car and apologized to her for forgetting about it. Su King gets out of the car and asks if she remembers her. Su King recognizes her and says that she is her aunt. Ning Kanlin runs out to them and is happy to see his fourth brother. Everyone was happy to meet their relatives. Su King says that grandma is also here. They need to see her quickly. She takes Su King to her grandmother and she is happy to meet her mother. Grandma burst into tears, hugging her and asking why she didn't contact them for so long. Ning Bei and Su King stand at the entrance to the room and watch them. They leave, and he says that he is really very sorry that he could not come for her, but he is ready to make up for it. She can name any of her desires, and if it is within his power, he will fulfill it. Su King says that he has no need to apologize. When she saw her aunt, she realized that he was really busy. Although she still has a desire, albeit a meaningless one. Ning Bei says she can just say it. Su King says that in fact, there are even several wishes. The first thing is that after today, she wants her aunt and grandmother to live calmly and not have any worries. Ning Bei says that as long as he is here, of course they will be fine. Su King says that then the second thing is that she wants everything to go smoothly with a financing from the Su family conglomerate so that the elder brother can breathe out in peace. Ning Bei asks, does her conglomerate finance anything? Su King agrees and says that it has already been three months. But the elder brother says that things are going hard due to the very harsh conditions. Ning Bei says then let him give it up and withdraw the money. It's better to unite with the Ning family and invest together in new areas of Dragon City. Su King says that things are not as simple as he thinks. And the third is her desire. She thinks that she doesn't want their engagement to be broken, especially now that they've met. She says that the last wish is small. She wants someone who didn't go to regular school to go to university and complete a four-year curriculum. She opened her eye and looked at him for a while. Ning Bei says that in general, a diploma from Beiling Military Academy is valued much higher than an ordinary university diploma. Su King says that she has never heard of this academy. How will he look for a job if companies don't know about his academy? Ning Bei chuckled when he heard this. 
She says that indeed, he is the eldest son and heir of the Ning family. He probably won't have to refer to the educational institution. Ning Bei pats her on the head and says that she doesn't have to worry. He said that he would fulfill her wish, so he will do it. He will receive a diploma from a regular university. Someone gets out of the car and says that the Shi family has arrived for a visit. Ning Canlan tells Director Shi that he arrived at such a late hour. He asks for forgiveness for not coming out to them right away. The director says that he doesn't care who won or lost in their internal struggle. It's their business. However, their son is a criminal. Grandmother asks him how her son-in-law offended their family. The director bowed and said that she is here too. Zhengxiang should come closer to let Grandma Su judge for herself. He must show how much he was hurt by the eldest son of the Ning family. Ning Kanshan asks, are these wounds? There's no need to worry about this at all. The director is surprised and asks if it seems to him that these are not serious wounds. He is surprised and asks, is he the fourth elder name? Ning Kanshan says that he greets Mr. Ji. He hopes that everything is fine with him. The director wonders if he didn't die a long time ago. Why does it seem to him that something strange has been going on in the Ning family lately? He says that be that as it may, they severely wounded his son. If they don't get an explanation, they won't let it go so easily. Ning Kanshan asks what kind of explanation does their family want. Director, she says it's simple. Let Ning Bei come out, kneel down and admit that he was wrong. Su King comes into the room and says that Shi Jingxiang insulted him first. Her grandmother says that she should not interfere in the conversation of her elders. Ning Bei really shouldn't hurt everyone, so it would be better if he apologized. The director says that this is not enough. He must ask for forgiveness on his knees, otherwise the Ning family will have to face the consequences. Ning Bei tells Grandma that she is too partial to the Shi family. The director slammed his hand on the table and asked what he was trying to say. Did she show them mercy? Granny says that the Shi family's grandfather is her brother, so he should show them respect and let them go. Ning Bei asks, do they want him to apologize on his knees? The director says he is right. He says that he is afraid that the Shi family will not be able to accept his admiration. The director says that he need not worry because they are ready for any consequences. Ning Bei makes a very fast wave of his hand. Grandma Su says he shouldn't kneel, she didn't ask for it. The old man comes to them and says that he should not kneel. He goes further into the room and says that he cannot do this. The director asks his father what is he doing here. The old man slaps him in the face and tells him that he must kneel down immediately. The director is very surprised by his father's reaction. The old man hits the floor with his cane and says that he must kneel. The director immediately knelt down. The old man also kneels down and says that the Shi family from Dragon City welcomes Commander Ning. Grandma Su asks third brother what is he doing. As long as she was here, she would protect his family. The director is surprised that he called him Commander. Ning Bei says that he said that they could not accept his admiration. They have ten seconds to disappear from his sight. The old man thanked the commander for his mercy. The Shi family leaves this building. Grandma says that then it's time for her to go too. Su King tells her mom that she will see her off. Ning Kanshan asks why he even contacted the Shi family. Ning Bei says that they provoked him. It appears that Shi Jingxiang was stalking Su Qin, which led to a small altercation near the university. Ning Kanshan says that he spent 13 years on the northern border. It seems that he has achieved a lot there. Ning Bei says that he defended the border of their country from invaders. It was not about awards and honors. Some time later, he sits on the roof and meditates. Su King calls this liar and says that he should come out. Ning Bei heard this and jumped off the roof towards her. She asks if he remembers what he promised her last night. He says that he remembers her wish and will keep his word. They walk together and he tells his father that he will be gone for a while. Ning Kanlin says that he knows about it. He grew up on a military base. His mother is worried that it will be difficult for him to get used to social life. So she asked Su King to go to the university with him for a few days. Ning Bei asks, is this mom's idea? She says that may be so. He smiled, and after a while, they came to the university. Su King says that there is a special transfer student. First, you need to visit the director. The girl at the entrance says that the director is not there now. They need to make an appointment to meet him. Su King says that this is very boring. She'll just call him. She turns on the phone, and there was a photo of Ning Bei on the screen. He notices his photo and smiles a little. Su King hid the phone and asked what he was looking at. He says it's nothing like that. She can call. She calls the director and says he is not answering. This old man must have gotten drunk again. 
Ning Bei looks at the painting in the hall and asks, is he the director? He asks her to give her phone and says that he wants to call him. Su King asks, does he know director song? She gives him the phone and someone asks who is talking now. This is a secret line, where did he get this number from? Ning Bei says it's him. The man is surprised and asks, is this his majesty the king of the north? What will be the orders? He asks, there was a teacher at Liang Military Academy named Song Zhen, right? The man says this is true, but then he was fired because there were complaints that he was a bad lecturer. He is inferior to Qin Lin and Ziyu Yuan. Ning Bei says they should find him and tell him to call him. Su King asks, did he study with professors Kong Lin and Ziyu Yuan? He agrees and says that these are good teachers, he attended their lectures. She asks, does he even realize how incredible they are? One is the dean of a medical college, and the other is a nuclear physicist who won the honorary Gordon Bell Award. Ning Bei says that she still does not understand what Baoyang Military Academy is. At the same moment, someone starts calling the phone. He answers the call and puts the phone to his ear. Song Jan apologizes and says he was in a meeting. Can he ask? Ning Bei gives his name to the teacher and says that he and Su King are standing in front of the door to the principal's office. Can he ask him to come over? Song Jen says that she said yesterday that someone wants to enroll. So did she mean him? He throws a stack of papers and says that he is on his way to them. Some time later. He comes to them and, opening the door, says that they can come in. Su King says that this is Ning Bei that she told him about. Song Jen says that he knows him. They met five years ago. Ning Bei says that nevertheless, he should allow him to introduce himself formally. He says his name and says that he is the eldest son of the Ning family, born here in the Dragon City. Song Jen asks, is he from Dragon City? He never mentioned it when she was working at the military academy. Su King says that since they know each other, he should help him with the documents. Song Jen asks, did she say enrollment? It's simply impossible. She asks what's wrong with this. He says that with Mr. Ko Ning's talent and education, studying here is a waste of time. He will hire him as Dean Emeritus. Ning Bei says that he cannot promise that he will come every day. Song Jen says that he should not rush to refuse. Will this be enough as a salary? He opens the box in Su King and asks if this is a diamond. Ning Bei says it's not like that, it's a spiritual stone. The Tang Empire was created by martial artists. They needed these stones for development and training. Unfortunately, the traditions of ancient martial arts are almost lost. Almost no spiritual stones are found, and spiritual herbs have degenerated. Song Jen Song Jen asks, how about a stone a month for being a dean? Ning Bei asks if he really has that many spiritual stones. He says that right now he only has this one, but he doesn't have to worry because he can find more. Ning Bei says three stones a month, and then he will work for him. Song Jen is delighted and says that they have agreed. Some time later, Su King asks why he left. Ning Bei says that he said that he would look for spiritual stones for him. Director Song Jen walks with many people towards the office. They all go inside the office together. People ask, is this him? So young, is he going to let him lecture? Song Jen asks Lai if he remembers that anti-gravity theory Mr. Yang published in an academic journal. The man says that of course he remembers. That paper advanced anti-gravity research by 10 years. But what does he have to do with it? Song Jen says that it is because Ning Bei wrote that article. The man says that this is impossible. Why would Mr. Young steal other people's achievements? Ning Bei says that this is not considered theft because he himself allowed it. The man asks, then what was the purpose of that article? He says it's the industrialization of anti-gravity. This greatly surprises the people who came with the director. He says he doesn't have much time to waste on idle chatter. The man asks him to wait and says that he also has a stone. Ning Bei looks at the stone that the man handed him. The other teachers say that they also have these stones. He is surprised and asks, so they all have spiritual stones. The man says that ten years ago, Cheng explored Mount Bayan. There he found such a stone, initially mistaking it for a diamond. However, upon returning and doing research, he discovered that it was something else. So he just gave them pieces of the stone, and when Song Zhen said they needed it, they collected it and brought it. The other man says that it is true, he also has such a stone. Ning Bei asks where exactly did they find these stones? The man says that only Chang knew about it. He asks, how can he meet this professor? Song Jen says that he died a long time ago. Ning Bei thinks about it, then it turns out that no one knows the place. Song Jen says that of course the professors will be able to evaluate Mr. Ning as Dean. 
He will personally see to it. The man says he must be joking. This article on antigravity alone allows us to consider Mr. Ning as an academician. Another man tells Mr. Pan Ning that deans usually guide students and lead large research projects. The man says he should join them. The main direction of their research is precisely the industrialization of antigravity. Ning Bei says that they will definitely discuss this, but later. For now, he wants to know more about this stone. The man says that Cheng and Wang found these stones on Mount Bayan, but they don't know anything else, and they are gone now. Ning Bei asks how long they stayed in the mountains. Song Zhen says about 10 days. They didn't take much food with them, so they didn't expect to stay for a long time. Ming Bei thinks that in 10 days, two people would not be able to go far and return. Perhaps the search area is limited to 100 miles. A vein of spiritual stones is somewhere in this radius. After some time on the street, Su King asks where will he go now. Ning Bei says he will go home. With these stones, he can easily put his mother on her feet. He leaves, and she says that it looks like trying to get him to go to university was a useless idea. Some time later, Ning Bei notices a large crowd of people standing on the street. The man asks, are there really no rules for ambulances? They should compensate him for his car. The guy asks, he got behind the wheel drunk, and now he's attacking others. The man slaps him in the face and says that he can also beat him. Does he even know who he is? His name is Du Hao. People are surprised and say that he is from the Du family. You shouldn't provoke him. The girl lifted the old man lying on the road, and with tears on his face, said that someone should help grandfather. Her brother had just returned from the northern border, where he spent ten years, and all he wanted was to see his grandfather. Grandpa must hold on. He really wanted to see his grandson. Ning Bei passes through the crowd of people and goes towards what happened. He tells Du Hao that he should let him go if he is not tired of living. He is surprised by this and asks how dare he threaten him. Ning Bei passes by them without paying attention to them. Du Hao takes out a knife and runs towards him. He throws a very quick punch with his hand and pushes him away. He screams in pain in his hand. Two doctors lift a man on a stretcher. Ning Bei touches the man's neck and says that he can no longer be saved. He approaches the girl and asks, Did she say that her brother served on the northern border? The girl agrees and asks if he can help her grandfather. Ning Bei checks the old man's breathing and says that she doesn't have to worry because he will be fine. His illness is not that dangerous, he can be easily cured. The girl says that six months ago, the doctors said that it was a miracle that he was still alive. Another ambulance arrives at them. The doctor runs to the girl and asks how Mr. Kaio feels. The girl turns to him and calls him Uncle Zhen. He tells Ijin that everything is fine and she shouldn't cry. They need to get him to the hospital quickly. Ning Bei says the patient is in critical condition and cannot be transported now. Jen asks who is he. He says that they should give him their silver needles. He asks how he knows he has these needles. Ning Bei uses his energy and attracts arrows to himself. He sticks all these needles into the old man's body. Jen is surprised by this and asks if he can really control the needles using Kai. The old man felt better and began to move. Ning Bei takes out the stone he received recently and sends energy into the old man's body. Suddenly, the old man opens his eyes and is surprised by this. Ning Bei says that it extended his life by a year. If he takes good care of his health, he can live three more. He turns around and is about to leave. The old man asks Mr. Doctor to stop. Du Hao approaches him and says that he should identify himself. One day, he will force him to repay the debt. Ning Bei makes a very fast swing of his hand, and Du Hao receives a blast of energy and falls to the ground. People watching this are very surprised by this. The old man says that they don't have to worry about him, because he will help him settle everything. He hands over a business card and says that if he has any problems in the Dragon City, he can contact him. Yijin says that she is very grateful to him. Ning Bei says she shouldn't thank him. What is her brother's name? She says the name is Kaio Dong. He recognizes this name and calls him the Eastern Wolf. Yijin asks does he know her brother? Ning Bei says that her brother is a true hero. He leads the Baoliang army of hundreds of thousands of elite warriors and has earned the nickname of the Eastern Wolf by performing many outstanding military achievements. Yijin and the old man looked at each other with a joyful look. She asks what is his name. He leaves and says his name is Ning Bei. If they need his help, they can find him at the Ning family's house. He leaves, and they look after him. Some time later, King Hulan hesitantly gets to her feet and tells her son that she can walk again. 
Ningbei thinks that seven spiritual stones are not a pity for this. Mu Roman Eleven comes to them and says that she congratulates her on her recovery. King Hulin greets her and tells her that she can come in. Mu Roman Eleven tells His Majesty, the King of the North, that ten billion dollars have been transferred to the accounts of the Ning conglomerate. Ningbei says that she can go to her father at the Ning conglomerate to help him set up an exploration subsidiary. First of all, you need to explore Mount Bayan. Mu Roman Eleven says it will be done. After that, she immediately leaves. King Hulen asks why he suddenly decided to go into exploration. Ningbei says that he is looking for something specific. Some time later, Su King comes into his room and asks why he is sitting here. He must get dressed and follow her. Ningbei asks, will they go to Tang Yaxing's birthday party? She asks if she knows, then why does she ask? She talked to Aunt King, she agreed, so he should get ready. He must do her a favor and keep her company. Mingbei says that he does not like such noisy holidays. Su King loudly calls Aunt King. King Hulan immediately comes to the room and tells him that she personally came to ask him to come with her. If he doesn't go, how will she explain this to her friends? Ningbei feels a lot of pressure and thinks how much easier life was for him in the border garrison. Some time later, he takes his sword from the wall and plans to take it with him. Su King asks him if they are going to a birthday party, then why does he need a sword? Ningbei looked at the sword in his hand and thought about it. He hangs the sword back and says that he doesn't need a suit, he'll dress simpler. Some time later, they are driving fast in the car together. Su King looks at him and thinks that he is very stubborn. The car stops near the Sanyang Entertainment Center. They both go into the building, where a large number of people have already gathered. The girl notices Su King and waves her hand and says that she should come here. She approaches this girl and asks, is she already drinking and didn't even wait for her? The guy sitting next to them asks who is with her. The girl asks, well, who else if not her fiancé from childhood? The two guys laughed at her joke. Su King asks them not to laugh. The guy tells Ningbei that his name is Tang Jiaoyong. He is grateful to him for coming to his younger sister's holiday. And now we should stop talking, it will be better if they drink. Tang Yuxing slaps his hand and says that he doesn't need to make things up. It is obvious that she is his older sister, and he is her younger brother. Su King says that they are actually twins, and she was born 15 minutes before him. Ningbei refuses the glass that was handed to him, and says that he is forbidden to drink. Tang Jiaoyong says that everything is fine, because it doesn't matter what he drinks. The guys say that everyone drinks alcohol, but he wants something else. This is a big disappointment. Today is Tang Yuxing's birthday. If he doesn't drink, it means he doesn't respect her. Tang Jiaoyong gets angry and says that they shouldn't start a fight. Su King says that she will drink instead of him. It's okay, she'll just drink instead. It's her birthday after all. The guys say he even lets the girl drink instead of him. Is he even a man? The abandoned son of the Ning family is just a dog thrown out after the death of the family. Tang Jiaong slams his glass on the table with great anger and tells Mr. Brisa Shi that he should stop causing trouble. Today is his sister's birthday, and he will kill anyone who dares to ruin this day. Tang Yuxing says he shouldn't be so angry. Ningbei snatched the glass from Su King's hands, and she asked what he was doing. He says that he promised his grandmother that he would protect her. So how can he let her drink instead of him? He drinks alcohol, and she says that he is forbidden. He says that either a ban or a promise would still have to be broken. Tang Jiaoyang laughs and says that since he decided to make an exception anyway, they can drink again. Ningbei agrees to this. Tang Yuxing grabbed Su King's hand and said that let the guys drink, but they'd better go dancing. A guy comes up to them and asks if they are drinking, but didn't invite him. Tian Jiaoyang tells third brother Yu that he did not say that he was coming. He says that today is Tang Yuxing's birthday. How could he not come? He sat down next to them, and Tang Jiaoyong says that he will introduce them. This is Yu Feng, and this is Ning Bei. He must have heard of him. Yu Feng agrees and says that they should drink to meet each other. Ning Bei says that with his internal injuries, he should limit his drinking. Yu Feng is surprised and asks, so he still has medical skills. Tang Jiaoyong asks third brother, did he identify correctly? How is he feeling? Yu Feng says it doesn't matter. He was part of a special operations squad, and one day their captain invited a demon, no one knows from where, to prepare them for real combat clashes. Against this demon, he could not even last ten blows. Tang Jiaoyong asks, has he already reached the rank of warrior? 
Ningbe says that this is not so. If he were a warrior, he would not have gotten off so easily. Yufeng is surprised and asks if he also knows martial arts. Ningbe agrees and says that it can be said that way. He apologizes and says that he did not know that he masters ancient martial arts. But can he even determine his strength by looking at it? Ningbe is about to answer something, but turns around and notices something. The guy approaches Su King and says that he welcomes these handsome men. Would they do him the honor of dancing with him? She says that she is grateful for the offer, but she is against it. The guy says that since they don't want to dance, that means they don't want to. But then they should at least have a drink with him. Tang Yuxing says there is no problem with that. Su King calls her name. The guy holds out a glass and offers to drink. She doubts and is about to take the glass. Ning Bei walked up to them and snatched the glasses from both girls' hands. Tang Yuxing says that he should return their drinks. Su King asks, what is he doing? Tang Jiaoyang comes up to him and asks, is something wrong? Ning Bei hands him the glass and says that he should take a look for himself. After that, he punches the guy in the face. Tang Jiaoyong looks into the glass and says there are drugs in it. Yu Feng got angry and asked this guy, is he tired of living? Several guards walk through the crowd and ask what they are doing. What happened here? Tang Jiaoyong holds the guy by the throat and says that they should call Du Yuan. The guard asks who he is. He gives his name and says that he is from the Tang family. The guards are very surprised by this. Some time later, Du Yuan approaches them and asks what made the young master from the Tang family angry. Tang Jiaoying throws out the contents of the glass and says that his sister was just about drunk. The guard is surprised and wants to say something to the president. Du Yuan says he is fine. They must drag him out and break his arms. The guards take the guy away and say they will do it. The guy tells the boss that he was wrong. Du Yuan asks the young master, will he be satisfied with this resolution of the situation? Tang Yuxing says that she is tired of dancing. Do they have separate rooms for karaoke? Du Yuan says that they will organize everything now. They leave and Ning Bei continues to look at him. He stops bowing and says that they should look after this guy because he was the one who injured Hao. The woman asks why don't they grab him right away. Du Yuan asks, is she completely stupid? Here you Feng Xu Zhenyin, there is no need to provoke people from great families. They will calmly do everything later. She says she understood him. At the same time, they are led by a waiter through an expensive hall. Tang Jiaoyang notices that Yu Feng is worried about something and asks third brother what's wrong. Ning Bei says that someone is watching them. The guy who was watching them was surprised that they found out about him and hid. They all sat down on the sofa. Tang Jiaoyang asks, does anyone dare to follow him? Ning Bei says that he doesn't have to bother himself with this because he is not the target. Yu Feng says that he never told him. How does he know that the person who injured him did not reach the rank of warrior? Ningbei says that there are very specific characteristics inherent in those who have reached the rank of warrior. They learn how to put energy from the Danchen into their strikes. Yu Feng says that in other words, if he had missed such a blow, he would still be lying in a hospital bed. Now he understands. Tang Yuxing says they should stop this boring talk, they can sing. The guys say Ningbei should sing. After all, they need to keep their face in front of the young lady from the Tang family. He seems to disrespect not only her, but them as well. An outcast of the Ning family, he considers himself an important person. They say that an abandoned son is worse than a dog. Tang Jiaoyong kicks one of them in the shoulder. He asks, do they like talking nonsense so much? If they don't want to drink with them, then they'd better leave. She asks if he really wants to quarrel with him over some idiot. Tang Jiaoyong says to this rich boy, that he thought too much of himself. He won't lose anything by quarreling with him. The guy leaves and says that he seems to be a primary level fighter, he should wait. And this outcast, who is worse than a dog too. Ning Bei ran towards him very quickly and grabbed him by the throat. People are surprised by this and ask if he really has the rank of warrior. Yu Feng tells Xi Jinyang that he doesn't know anything about life because no one has contacted him before because of his family. Su King is very surprised by what is happening. She approached him and tells Ning Bei that he should let him go because he could kill him. Yu Feng says that he should teach him a lesson, but killing him is not worth it. The guy agrees and says that if a warrior dares to kill an ordinary person, then the Special Operations Department of the Dragon Guard will deal with him. Ning Bei asks why he should be afraid of the Special Operations Division. The guy runs away and says that here a warrior is killing an ordinary person. Tang Jiaoying runs after him and asks what he is doing. He manages to grab it and sees a guard walking towards them. 
He says that someone is really coming here. Yu Feng says that he was actually able to call the Dragon Guard. Tang Jiaoyang must calm Ning Bei down, and he will take care of him. He approaches the Dragon Guard and says that he is asking him to make an exception. He also serves in the garrison of the Dragon City. The guard says that the Special Operations Department is working, and those who try to stop him will be killed on the spot. Yu Feng was surprised by what he said. He runs at him and says that in that case he is ready. The guard notices him and manages to kick him to stop him. Tang Jiaoyang asks how dare he hit his third brother. He begins to run towards the dragon guard. He notices that he is about to attack him and strikes with his sword. Ning Bei notices this. He throws Xi Zhenyang aside and runs towards them. He runs up to the dragon guard and says that he must stop. The guard steps away from him and says that as a martial artist, if he broke the law by attacking an ordinary person, then he must be punished. The punishment for wounding is three years in prison, for injury ten years, for murder immediate execution. Ningbei says that if he knows the laws so well, then he should know another one. It is forbidden to raise a sword against comrades. The guy asks who he is. Ningbei opens her kimono and reveals her sword. Su King thinks that he secretly brought the sword with him. The guy is surprised to see the sword, kneeling down and saying that he welcomes the commander. He is Han Lai from the Dragon City Special Operations Department. People are surprised by this and ask if he really called him commander. Yu Feng is surprised and says that this is the sword of the Northern King. Ning Bei says that he should get up because they don't need unnecessary formalities. Su King says that he is not allowed to fight, or he will tell Aunt King everything. He agrees and says that then she should give him the phone. He tells Han Lai that he must remove it. He agrees and takes Shi Zhenyan away. His friend is surprised by what is happening. Ning Bei dials a number and calls someone. An old man lying on a deck chair begins to ring. He answers the call and asks who is it. Ning Bei says it's him. The old man is surprised to hear his voice and says that he has already been visiting the Ning family for several days, but he can come himself at any time. Ning Bei says that this is not an urgent matter. That's what he wanted to ask. There is a certain Liang Zhu in his Liang family, right? The old man agrees and asks what he has done. Ning Bei asks loudly, should he teach him a lesson himself or will he do it? The guy is very worried about this. The old man asks him to give him the phone. Liang Zhu took the phone and asked, is this grandpa? The old man says that he must kneel down. He should hurry up and kneel down quickly. Liang Zhu immediately does as he is told. The old man thinks that he should not blame him because he is trying to save his life. Ning Bei says it's getting late, they should go home. Su King agrees with him. Tang Jiaoyang says they should go their separate ways then. The holiday party is over. He helps Yu Feng walk and asks if his strength is at the level of a general. Ning Bei says that's about it. Yu Feng thinks that he is an idiot. His strength is far beyond the rank of a general. Tang Jiaoyang asks third brother what he said about the commander. Yu Feng thinks that it seems that the king of the north doesn't want too much to be known about him. He says that this is just such an appeal. Tang Yuxing is already drunk and needs to be taken home. She lies on the sofa and sleeps. Ning Bei says that he was hurt and he knows medicine and can help him. Yu Feng says it's nothing. A couple of days of rest and he'll be fine. Tang Jiaoyang tells the third brother that he is already an adult, but he is still afraid of doctors. Yu Feng asks what he even understands about this. Ning Bei says that he should not move. He releases a small amount of energy that enters Yu Feng's body. He coughs up blood and Tang Jiaoyang worries about third brother. He asks if he is okay. Ning Bei asks if he feels better. Tang Jiaoyang asks, what is he talking about? He is coughing up blood. We need to take him to the hospital. Yu Feng wipes the blood from his face and is surprised to say that he feels much better. Ning Bei says that his body is fine now. He thanked him for this. Su King yawns and says that she is tired. Ning Bei says that he understands her, then he will take her home. Sometime later. Yu Feng bows and bids him farewell. Ning Bei does the same and says that they will see each other again. They leave and several guards come running to them. One of them tells Mr. Ning that their boss wants to talk to him. Su King got scared and hid behind Ning Bei. He says he has to take them away. They go up to the seventh floor and exit the elevator. Di Yun says that Madame Su is not related to the matter he wants to discuss with him. They should arrange a car for her to take her home. Su King begins to worry and says that he may not even think about offending him. Ning Bei puts his hand on her shoulder and says that she doesn't have to worry, everything will be fine. She is very surprised by this. 
She was taken out the door, and she asks them to let her back in. She is very worried about what might happen behind that door. Do Yoon asks Mr. Gyo Ning if he knows who he injured this morning. Ning Bei, with a clear lack of interest, asks who did he hurt. Do Yuan slams his fist on the table and says that it was Du Hao, his only son. He crippled his hand and nearly killed him. He will die this night. His guards immediately drew their swords. Someone called him and he answered the call. Someone says that he seems to be out of his mind. He dared to attack one of his brothers. Du Yuan is surprised and tells young Master Tang that he has already shown him enough respect by not ruining his sister's birthday but he cannot help but avenge his son. Many guards rush to attack with their swords. Ningbei pulls out his sword from the knife and very quickly defeats many of the guards. Defeating all the guards in this room and with a sharp movement of his hand removes the blood from his sword. Diyuan is very surprised by this and asks, is he a general ranked martial artist? How is this even possible? Ningbei wipes his face and looks at him very menacingly. Someone opens the door to this room. Tang Jiaoyong asks Brother Ning if he is okay. Su King stands behind him and Yu Fong. She asks how is he. Du Yun runs away and asks Mr. Dei Tang to save him. He grabs his leg and Tang Jiaoyong says that he should leave him alone. The woman grabbed Su King and put the gun to his head. She says they shouldn't move. What happened surprises them all very much. Ning Bei says with a very menacing look that she must let her go. The woman says that she knows that he is very strong. As a general-level martial artist, he could reach her in the blink of an eye. But she needs less to pull the trigger. He won't be able to outrun the bullet. Ning Bei asks who told her that he is just a general. The woman is very surprised and asks what did he say. Ning Bei begins to emit very strong energy around him. His energy releases very strong waves. Tang Jiaoyong and Yu Feng can hardly resist such a flow of energy. Di Yuan says that there is incomparable pressure that can stop an entire army. He is definitely a god of war. Ning Bei grabbed his sword and began to unsheath it. He strikes very quickly with his sword. The woman did not immediately notice that with this blow he cut off her hand. Her hand falls to the ground and she screams in pain. Ning Bei hugged Su King and said that she shouldn't look at this. He pulled her close and says that everything is okay now. He asks if she realizes the price she will have to pay for attacking her. The woman trembles in pain and tells the great god of war that she was wrong. She asks for mercy. Ning Bei says that there are not many people he wants to protect, and this girl is one of them. He throws a card in her direction, which sticks into the ground next to her. Ning Bei leaves and says that she has already endured a lot today, and besides, he doesn't want to dirty the Northern King's sword anymore. So she should be happy as long as he remains alive for now. She needs to take it. She picks up this card and looks at it with fear. Yu Feng notices that this is the sign of a sword. Tang Jiaoying asks, is that all? Will he just let them go? Sometime later. Ning Bei asks Tang Jiaoyong for a ride to the Su family's house. He says there is no problem. They are driving in the car, and he says that Su King was very scared. I will have to apologize to Grandma Su. Du Yuan will not get away so easily. He will kill him. Yu Feng says that he can forget about him. Even the god of war would die if given such a sign. Tang Jiaoying asks, is he talking about that card? What it is. Yu Feng says that he should drive. He will explain to him later. Sometime later. Zio Yunsheng and several other people came to Du Yuan's office. A man in similar clothes comes out of the office. He says that this is the leader of Kinju, Kuo Jantan. This guy wipes the blood from his hands and tells the captain that he is late. He has already fixed the problem. Zio Yunsheng says that this is the responsibility of the Special Operations Department. What is the secret department doing here? Kuo Jantin says he is just following orders. He jumps up very quickly and leaves here. Zio Yunshin gets angry looking at him. Some time later. Song Jen puts the book on the table and says that this is Professor Wang's old notebook. There are also entries about hiking in the mountains. Ning Bei starts reading this book and says that there are three pages torn out. Song Jen says that he didn't know about it. He says that Professor Wang went to the mountains on the 1st of July 2010. Here there are records of only seven days of his campaign. Song Jen asks, are missing pages a big problem? Ning Bei says that someone tore out these pages for a reason, but using the clues from the previous seven pages, they can narrow down the search area. Song Jen says that he is glad that he was able to help him after all. Ning Bei agrees and says that he is grateful to him. Are there any conditions? He says that he just hopes that he will visit his laboratory on occasion. 
Ningbei says that of course he will visit him before the lecture. Song Jen says that this is wonderful, he is grateful to him. After some time, he stands in front of the board and says that he is researching anti-gravity. He hopes they will lead to industrialization and eventually replace energy resources like oil. Ningbei says that by installing anti-gravity devices on airplanes, it will be possible to reduce takeoff and landing times. As for energy, so far nuclear energy seems to be a better replacement for fossil resources than gravitational energy. Song Zhen says that their research laboratories do not reach the necessary level for this, and new ones are expensive to build. Ningbei puts his hand on his shoulder and says that he knows about it. It's been five years since their country has been going into nuclear energy. But huge investments and the best experts are needed. They will return to this conversation later, but for now he has a lecture. Will he come to him? Song Jen says that he will definitely come to him. Sometime later. Many students are sitting in a classroom with computers. Ningbei entered the classroom and the student asked what did this guy forget here? The student says she doesn't know about it. Maybe he came in for a laugh while the professor is away. The guy raises his hand and asks if he got lost by chance. Professor Ning will be coming soon, so he should take his place if he doesn't want any trouble. Ningbei thanked him for the warning with a kind face. He continues to stand at the board. The students say that he still doesn't leave. They will see what Professor Ning does to him when he comes. Someone opens the door and enters the classroom. The students are surprised that President Song himself came to court, as well as Professor Lai and Professor Zhu. Ningbei raises his head after the professors sat down at the tables. He says it's time to start the lesson. She says her name and says that this is his first lecture at Bayan University. The students are surprised and ask, is he a professor? He looks younger than him. Did he buy this position or something like that? Ningbei says that computer science is both a theoretical and practical subject. The students tell the professor that they already remember the introductory lesson of the first year. He must tell him something new. Ningbei thinks that these are very arrogant students. He will have to show them his abilities, otherwise they will never begin to take him seriously. Professor Lai asks if they should help Professor Ning capture the audience's attention. Song Jen thinks about it and says that they should trust him. He feels that he can handle it himself. Ningbei says they are right. He will send this material to their computers, they can reread it in their free time. The girl asks why don't they start a group. This will make it easier to share files. He says there is no need for this, he will send everything directly. Students ask, did he say it directly? How is this possible? Via flash drives or what? Suddenly the computers start downloading. Students ask what's going on. What's wrong with his computer? Professor Lee asks, isn't that bad? Song Jen says he need not worry. Ningbei asks, well, is this more interesting? The students are very surprised by what happened. He says they seem to be quite interested in information security. Well, then they'll talk about it. Song Jen smiles as he watches him teach the lesson. Ningbei continues teaching the lesson while something is being installed on the student's computers. A student notices the guy filming and asks what he is doing. The guy says that such events should be posted on the internet. At the same time, the guy loudly tells the boss that he should look at this. Here is a video about their university. The guy looks at it and asks, this is their audience, right? He smiles and says that he will show him what he can do. A loud sound occurs in the audience, which surprises Ningbei. A video of a dancing mouse appears on the computer. Students ask, what's the matter? Where did this come from? Could it be a virus? The guy tells Professor Ning that the firewall on his computer doesn't work very well. The students laugh and ask who did this. They were able to hack even the professor's computer. Ningbei says how annoying this is. The guy says that this professor is nothing special. The guy tells the boss that he is still among the thousand best hackers in the country. Suddenly Ningbei's voice comes from the speaker. He asks if this is true. The guy is surprised and asks who said that. He says that he didn't think about the consequences, did he? There is no reason to be proud of being among the top thousand hackers. A video from this guy's webcam appears on his computer. The guy says that this is Ningbei. This is the professor who is now giving a lecture. The students say he looks familiar. Isn't this Zhang Yongpeng by any chance? For sure, this is his room. This is a live stream from a dorm. They should look at the fact that he is wearing shorts. The guy shut up and say he should shut it down faster. Zhang Yongpeng says it doesn't work. He can't turn it off. The other guy says he should pull the power cord faster. After that, the video ended immediately. The guy in shorts asks what they will do. 
Another guy asks if they won't be kicked out of the university for this. Zhang Yangpeng says that he dared to play with him. He will see how he copes with his teacher. At the same time in the financial company Yangtai. Zhuo Ling asks, did he say Ningbei? He knows this university well because he is his teacher. He doesn't have to worry, he'll figure it out. He ends the call and says that he is the security chief of the largest financial company in Dragon City. He starts typing and says the real boss is coming into play. At the same time, Professor Lee laughs and says that he has taken control of these idiots. Ningbei says that these students turned out to be quite good. He notices something and the professor asks, is something wrong? Ningbei says that someone is trying to hack them. Professor Lai asks, is it those students again? They already asked the director not to punish them, so why should they? Ningbei looks intently at the monitor and says that it is not them. The professor is shocked by this and asks if someone else is trying to hack them. If someone gets into their network, it will be very bad. Ningbei says he doesn't have to worry about it. This computer is new, there is simply nothing to steal here. And it will not allow you to reach other computers. Zhuo Ling says it was very easy to hack. This guy's skills aren't really that impressive. A guy runs up to him and tells his boss that the company's firewall has been hacked. Zhuo Ling is very surprised by this and asks what did he say. Many windows appear on his screen. He asks how is this possible. After all, he personally installed the protection and even asked several hackers to check it. No one has ever succeeded in doing this. So who did it? Who is behind this attack? The guy asks if they really provoked some important person. Zhuo Ling remembers what he did and thinks that this cannot happen. Yen and comes to them and asks what is going on. His security team can't do anything at all. People in the office say the accounts are blocked. Who changed his administrator status? He can't log in. They are the largest financial company in Dragon City, and now they cannot access accounts that contain more than 100 billion. All internal confidential information is also blocked. Yang and asks what will they do with customer deposits. The guy says that the enemy is very difficult. He went through all seven firewalls in just 15 seconds. Yang and turns to him in surprise and asks what did he say. Zhuo Ling says he knows who did it. Now all that remains is to wait for him to name the price. Ning Bei asks did he say the price. In their opinion, is he some kind of blackmailer? This greatly surprises everyone present. Yang and pushes Zhuo Ling away from the table and asks this gentleman, did they offend him in some way? However, this joke went too far. Ning Bei says that a person from their company carried out a hack attack on his computer. Do they think this can be considered an insult? All the people immediately turn to Zhuo Ling. Yang and asks what is going on here. He says that actually it was a little game. He goes on to explain what happened. Yang and gets very angry and hits the table with his fist. He says that instead of focusing on his work, he got them into trouble. He bows and tells Mr. Ning that everything happened because he did not take good care of discipline among the employees. He will transfer him 500,000 as an apology. Ning Bei says that as he already said, he is not interested in money. In an hour, all of their company's systems will be back to normal. They can take it as a lesson. All the employees bow and thank him for this. Ning Bei closes his laptop. The professor says he did a great job. Su King opens the door forcefully and calls out to Ning Bei. Tang Yuxing, who has not slept well, stands behind her. She is surprised to see Professor Lai. She became embarrassed and greeted him. The professor leaves and asks did she want to talk to him? Then he will leave. Su King says goodbye to the professor. After the professor leaves, she asks Ning Bei if she was the one who took her food card. He says that he already said that she can't eat today. Su King says that she didn't have breakfast because of him. And now he doesn't even give her lunch. She tries to take it away, but Ning Bei removes the card. Tang Yuxing says that if she is so worried about it, then they can eat outside the university. Why fight for this card? Su King continues to try to take the card from Ning Bei's hands and says that she doesn't care. She won't let him cause her any trouble. She is tired and says he should give it back. She once again tries to take it from his hands, but Ning Bei dodges her. He leaves and Su King asks, where is he going? He says he says he's going to the cafeteria. Would she like to go with him? She was happy and asked, can she eat now? Of course she will go. Some time later in the cafeteria, many people crowded in one place. They ask where they go without waiting in line. They shouldn't push. Su King says it will be better if they go upstairs. Mostly teachers eat there, but the food is better. Ning Bei points to the guy and asks, is he also a teacher? Tang Jiaoyong waves at them in greeting. 
They came to him and Tang Yuxing asks how a lazy person like him ended up here. He laughed and said that no one was looking at him. Su King is about to pick up the food on the plate with chopsticks. Ning Bei uses her chopsticks and removes her chopsticks. She asks what is he doing? Wasn't he the one who invited her to eat? He says that he invited her to come with him, but he didn't say anything about food. Su King got angry and asked, so he wants her to watch him eat. Ningbei says that she will be able to eat once the purple kai is fully absorbed. Brother and sister Tang ask, what is this purple kai? Someone comes up to them and says that the purple kai is from the east. This is called the aura of the sage. In other words, someone who is protected by purple kai can be considered a sage. Tang Jioing gets angry and says that he should leave here. The guy says that Purple Kai is a real treasure. It is very rare even among martial artists. According to rumors, the last time Purple Kai was seen was when the master, the founder of Taoism, left the Han Empire and went to the west. Violet Kai from the east descended from heaven. That is why it is called the Aura of the Sage. Ningbei asks, Violet Kai body protection, is he talking about this? A large amount of such energy appears around him. The guy is surprised and asks, so this is Purple Kai. Tang Yuxing is surprised and asks, so he has magic. The guy is surprised and says that only sages have such purple kai. Who is he? Ningbei asks, well, did she hear that? Purple kai is a good thing. Tomorrow he will give her more. Su King turns away from him and says that she doesn't want this. The guy hits the table with his palm and says that he wants this. Ningbei asks who he even is. The guy says he didn't mean anything like that. He does not ask for protection for free, he is ready to pay. Tang Yuxing says that he is the eldest son and heir of the Ning family, so he does not need money. The guy thinks about the Ning family. Su King asks if he will give her something to eat or not. Ning Bei says he already said she must endure. Tang Yuxing chuckled and asked how they would live once they got married. Su King blushed and asked who was talking about the wedding. They're just friends. Ning Bei put his chopsticks on the table and stood up. Tang Yuxing asks, does she not want to marry him? Su King says that she said from the very beginning that she would not marry him. Ning Bei comes up to her and says that he said that if she doesn't want to, then they can break off the engagement at any time. He will protect her family in any case. After that, he leaves them, a heavy atmosphere appears around him, and he continues to leave the cafeteria. Su King was embarrassed and looked at the floor. Tang Yuxing asks if she is already sorry. Tang Jiaoying says that he does not advise her to joke with such things. If she meant something else, then she shouldn't have said it that way. Su King felt sad and worried about what happened. Ning Bei came to the office and called his father. He says that he and Su King have decided to separate. He should discuss breaking the engagement with Grandma Su. Ning Kanlin asks him what happened. Ning Bei ended the call and looks out the window. Some time later in the gravity research laboratory. Professor Lee says they should let him introduce everyone. This is Ning Bei, he is a respected professor in their field, and will be the honorary director of this research laboratory from this day forward. This greatly surprises everyone present, and they begin to applaud. The man quietly asks, is he a professor? Looks more like a student. The girl says he is too young. Ning Bei looks around and says that the equipment is a bit simple. Hu Kiong says this is too much. The equipment of this laboratory is one of the best in the university. Is he looking at this gravity measuring device? It costs 8 million. It's the only one in the whole Dragon City. Ning Bei says that he has also seen equipment that costs 15 million. The woman is surprised and asks, is this true? The man says that this cannot be. Hu Kiong asks, is he talking about the model of 513 machine? Ning Bei agrees and says that there are only five such devices. Two at the Chinese Science Academy and three at the northern border. He will arrange for one of them to be sent here tonight. This greatly surprises everyone present. Ning Bei asks, are they really bad with funding? The girl asks who would even invest in them. Gravity Research receives almost no publicity, so much so that most people consider it a scam. Ning Bei asks, is that how it is? Then the Ning conglomerate will take over the investment. In return, the Ning conglomerate would receive 90% of the revenue and patents in the future. What will they say to this? Hu Qiang says he is asking too much. Professor Li says he should shut up. Professor Ning's research in this area surpasses them all. If he only needed money, he could do without it. He approaches him and tells Professor Ning that they agree. Ning Bei says that is good. He calls on the phone and tells Mu Roman 11 that she must transfer 1 billion to Bayan University's account. 
He ends the call and says that he proposes to change the direction of the research a little. You need to start with basic anti-gravity devices. Professor Lee agrees to this. People start going about their business and Ning Bei checks some documents. Some time later at night. People hear a very loud sound in the laboratory and do not understand what is happening. A large helicopter with a sword sign flies towards them. Hu Qiang asks what's going on. The girl asks why a helicopter landed on the playground. The guy who got out of the helicopter says that the A-level escort mission is one all outsiders should not approach. Hu Qiang says that this is a very large helicopter. Professor Li says that this is the latest transport helicopter. It can deliver tanks to the battlefield. The girl tells Professor Ning that he should not go there. They said no outsiders should approach. People line up in front of him. The guy says they greet the commander. He is Liu Qin from the 6th Escort Squad. Everyone lined up in rows and Ning Bei walked between them. Everyone is very surprised by what happened. Professor Lai says he thought he was just a scientific genius. Hu Qiang says he thought he was just an ordinary rich guy. The girl says that it seemed to her that Professor Ning was simply the youngest professor at this university. They all wonder who he is. Some time later. Ning Bei comes home and asks mom and dad why they are still awake. Ning Kanglin asks, did he quarrel with Su Kenga? King Hulin says that he is more than half a year older than her. He should be gentle with her. Ning Bei says that he understood what was going on. Su King is against this marriage with all his heart. There is no need to insist and develop this topic. It will be better if they go to bed. His parents call him at the same time. Some time later late at night, Ning Bei stands in the courtyard and jumps up very high and jumps onto the roof. Zio Yuncheng says that he pays respect to the king of the north. Ning Bei asks, has he found the third person he should kill? Zio Yangshan says that he has not found it yet, but it seems that he is among the people of Kuo Zhongdin, the leader of the Kinjuo Anbu. They have always had a difficult relationship with the Special Operations Division. He is worried about his safety. Ning Bei says that he should ignore him for now. Now he can go. Zio Yuncheng says he understands him. He immediately runs away. At the same time, Su King stands at the window and looks at the sky. Her grandmother comes to her and asks if she is still awake. She was surprised by this and said that she was sleeping, or rather almost sleeping. He comes to the door and asks why she is not sleeping if it is already so late. Grandma says that her Aunt King called him. She told about her and Ning Bei. This means there will be no marriage. Neither the Ning family nor the Su family will raise this issue again. Su King asks what happened. Grandma says that when she first said she didn't agree, she thought it was an accident. But she continued to refuse, and Ning Bei was not the type to pursue a girl. He is very proud, and besides, he already put up with her actions enough. If she refuses, then so be it. Her Aunt King said that they, on the bride's side, should be the ones to break off the engagement. This will help her save face in the future. Grandma leaves and closes the door behind her. Su King falls to his knees and begins to cry. She says that if he wants to break the engagement, he can do whatever he wants, as if she could find another guy. At the same time, Grandma walks through the yard of the house and says that she hopes that she really won't regret this. Su King Hui watches her and tells someone on the phone that everything is ready. The Ning family broke off the engagement. Some time later, Grandma says that Chief Gu has made them happy with his presence. It is an honor for her family. The man says she is too kind. Who is he compared to her? The guy behind him greets her. Grandma Su says he is a wonderful young man. The Gu family is blessed by the gods. The man says that his son is far from Su King, who is one of the rare talents of this city. Su King Hui says Uncle Gu is here with a marriage proposal. The man says that their families have known each other for decades. Su King likes Can Can. So how about, he doesn't have time to finish because his grandmother says that he knows young people these days. She needs to ask Su King his opinion. The man says he is in no hurry. He turns around and orders the gifts to be brought in. Many people carry large boxes into the building. Grandma Sue asks, what is this? People open boxes filled with gold bars and the man says that these are engagement gifts. Grandmother is very surprised by this and silently looks on. Sue King Hui tells Uncle Gu and Can Can that they have come a long way and must be tired. He will show them their rooms. A guy runs up to them and says that important guests have arrived outside. Zhang Zhuokian comes to them and says his name. Grandma Su tells the commander that he can come in and have some tea. He says she shouldn't worry. He throws a small card and says that he asks to accept this. 
Grandma is surprised when she sees this card stuck into the table. Kankin takes it and asks, what is this? Uncle Goo is surprised to see this and hits him on the hand and says that he should put it down immediately. It's none of his business and he shouldn't get involved in it. He asks Dad what is he doing. Grandma shakes in surprise when she looks at this. She thinks that if they take it, the entire Sioux family will be at risk. She tells Su King Huey that he should call Ningbei. Su King comes to them and says that she will call him herself. Ningbei sent him, right? And how beautifully he spoke. But in the end, he harbored a grudge and set his people against her grandmother. She calls him and is going to say something. Ningbei says that he is already here. Zhang Zhangquang bows to the king of the north. He passes by and, taking the card, says that he will accept this sign. All the Zhang family members from the three provinces could come and try to kill him. Zhang Zhangquan kneels down and says that he wouldn't dare. Su King tells him that he is a hypocrite and a liar. Does he really think that someone like Zhang Zhangquan acted without his orders? He stood up and was about to say something. Ningbei says he should shut up. Su King comes up to him and says that he always pretended that he was the cool and powerful king of the north, and now he came to scare her grandmother with this card. She raises her palm and says that he will tell him right away, if something happens to grandma, she will spend her whole life just to get even with him. Shang Zhangquan grabbed the sword and said that she would not dare to do this. Grandma Su says loudly that she has to stop. She stopped, and he came closer to her. Su King says that he should already let him kill her, they are just ants in his eyes. She starts crying and says that even though her family is weak, she will never humiliate herself in front of him. Ningbei tells Zhang Zhangquan that he should go back. This greatly surprises him. He gets very angry and says that he already said that he should go back. He leaves and says that the money from this card can be used at any time. With this, the Su family will never fall under anyone's control again. He put the card on the table, and as he leaves, he says that he won't bother her anymore. He puts on his cloak and loudly says that anyone who causes trouble for the Sioux family will face consequences. This surprises Grandma Sioux very much. Uncle Gu says they should leave here immediately. Sioux King remains in place and begins to cry. Ning Bei leaves this house and thinks that today he has settled his debt to the Sioux family. He turns around and says that the engagement was broken on his initiative, so he shouldn't bother the Sioux family anymore. He must also convey this to others. Zhang Zhangquan bows and agrees. Some time later. There are a lot of cars parked next to Ning Bei's house, and he was very surprised by this. Gu Guo runs to him and calls him brother. He picked her up and asked fourth uncle why there were so many cars outside. Ning Kanchen says that they all came with marriage proposals. Ning Bei asks, did he say marriage proposals? Do they have unmarried girls in their family? This is not about Guguo, right? It's too early for this. A car drives up to them and someone calls Ning Shui. Ning Kanchen asks, is he Mr. Lin? The man agrees and says that it is really him. Ning Bei asks, he's the head of the black division from the capital, right? What brought him here today? Lin says that he came here with a marriage proposal. Ning Bei asks if he also came with a marriage proposal. Lin says that he heard that he broke off his engagement with the Su family. His granddaughter is around his age, so he would like to propose her as a bride. Ning Kenshin says that he is far from the only one who came today with such a proposal. The door to the house opens and Ning Bei is surprised when he sees a huge number of people standing in the hall. People bow and greet his majesty, the king of the north. He thinks that they are all only interested in his power and status and they are using their daughters as bargaining chips. He says they have a minute to leave his house. This will greatly shock all the people present here. Ningbei says that they shouldn't force him to repeat it. All the people immediately got scared and ran away from the house. Guguo is surprised by this and calls him brother. He pats her on the head and says everything is fine. Ming Kanlin tells him that after this, no one will come to him with a marriage proposal anymore. Ningbei puts Guguo on the floor and says he doesn't need this. Ning Kanlin says that he himself broke the engagement with the Sioux family. Now it's time to think about someone else. He should at least look at these photographs. He and his mother are thinking. He does not have time to finish because Ning Bei, with a very quick movement of his hand, tore all the papers that were in his hands. After that, he immediately left and his father called him. Some time later. Some say that Kuo Linlong, the daughter of the Kuo family from Zhangdong, and En Yueyang, the daughter of the Chang family from Nanju, as well as the only daughter of the richest man in Kinju, Lu Fengji is the daughter of the guardian of the northern plains Lulu. Su King asks, were they all offered to marry him? 
Granny agrees and says that he refused them all. She was delighted and asked, so he didn't choose anyone. She thought so, he is stubborn and adamant. Grandma asks her, is she sure she doesn't like Mingbei? Su King says that she shouldn't even talk about it. The way he treated her today. Grandma says that if he was narrow-minded and really took up arms against the Su family, he wouldn't have come. She's right, isn't she? She takes her hand and says that when Zhang Zhangquan came to them and threw his sign, he definitely hid it from Ningbei. Su King asks, then why didn't he explain it? Grandma says that she attacked him with accusations without even finding out why he came. That's why he was so cold. Su King begins to worry and says that even apart from this incident, he never showed interest in her. Besides, a child's engagement means nothing. Grandma says that Ning Bei grew up on the northern border, where he went through many hardships. Did she really expect him to talk about love like those spoiled young people from their city? It's simply impossible. Su King starts crying and says that she can forget about it. Anyway, now she can't help it.